Ready as I'm gonna be, man. I'll tell you. This is how I feel on most pen casts. Right? Oh so my you're god. In, you're in good shape. That's exhausting. <laughs> You'll be fine. Man. All right. Okay, yeah. Let's do this. Let's do a thing. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome to episode number 54 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I am Brian Goulet. I'm Drew Brown. And we are here from Goulet Pens to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, and purple and extra for any such fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. In today's show, we're going to be talking about why the Lamy Emporium doesn't get a lot of love. The most popular ink color in each brand, where Drew's going to try to make me guess what they are. So that'll be a little fun activity. Hopefully I don't make a fool of myself. Uh, why Machier pens range so wildly in price. We're going to talk about which pens and ink the Avengers would use. I'll have a lot to contribute to that one, I'm sure. And we're going to talk about what it's like to work with your significant other, me and Rachel specifically. Uh, we've also got a hypothetical. We've got... Uh, look at the Twisby 580 Iris and all kinds of other turkey hannock shenanigans. So we're going to kick it off with some feedback. That's right, we are. And we are going to get a return from Bonzon. And mm -hmm. if you'll recall, Bonzon asked us about silent capping. Um, yes, yes, so, I remember this. Uh, yes, he mentions here in this comment, Thank you for providing such a detailed answer to my question. It's true that I couldn't stop laughing when Drew advised to drive people crazy with the Pilot VP, because I told him, <laughs> let's just start off really loud. Uh, but he was literally taking notes on all the suggestions. So he actually started writing that one down. Uh, he says, I guess I'll, I know, I'm sorry, I don't mean to say he. Uh, I guess that I have to agree with Drew's top pick, the E95S, since I've been considering that pen already after hearing you praise it on several occasions. I now have one more reason to want it, smiley face. On the mm. other hand, I may want to start with cheaper pens like the Genhal 51A or Lamy Safari, see how they work. There I appreciate go. that several other viewers made great suggestions too, and I'll consider them as well. What a great community. And I loved this comment specifically because of that community engagement mm. factor. I love that Bonzon was able to reach out to us comment again saying thank you to us it's just like this wonderful back and forth between bonzon and ourselves and then there was that further component of the community in the youtube comments adding in their opinions and insight as well and i just i love it so much it makes me so happy and That's right it's just it's a the pleasure. circle just, of life it's just awesome i love being surrounded <laughs> by that it's magical and wonderful and beautiful and yay so thank you for sharing that bonzon i appreciate that and then moving on to Mark, I thought this was funny because we discussed whether or not we wet both of our hands and then soap them in order to wash them or uh, go in dry, do one hand wet while the other hand gets all sudsy. Mm. And Mark here, I think, is uh, authorized to offer some insight. Mark says, wet both of your hands first. This protects the natural skin oil layer while still removing the badness. Hmm. Nature of my work, nurse practitioner, requires that I wash my hands 40 plus times a day. And I always wipe down the sink edge. We talked about that too. Yes. Always making sure that sink edge is so good. Good good job, Mark. Thanks wow. for fighting the good fight. So 40 that times makes sense. a day. Wow. Yes. But, so I guess what Mark is saying is that if you do soap first, soap eats away so much hmm. that it would take away your oils and dry your hands out a lot more. Hmm. Um, but if you wet them first, you get that little bit of you know, protection there and still get rid of all the bacteria and nastiness. So That's I'm going to take it from Mark. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, Mark, Mark does the thing, man. So I'm going to go with, uh, I mean, you're like a, with, you're like a hybrid drew. You're wet in one hand. Yeah. You're yeah. Just... But I'm, I'm, I'm going all the way. I also don't want dry fingies, Brian. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Don't want that cracklage happening. Yeah. I don't, I don't have that much of an issue myself. I got naturally really oily skin. Oh, not me. I get but, the I get the white webbing. It's disgusting. Oh yeah, I do oh, get that. Yeah. Like in the dead of winter, I might get that. Well, I mean, yeah, in the summer I'm okay, but basically any time other than summer, yeah, I'm dry. Wow. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Very cool. All right, and I got some feedback from Hannah. Hannah said, I knew Brian's Back to the Future answer would be the 2009 DC Pen Show, but I didn't know that he almost didn't go. That's right. I didn't know that go. either, Brian. Hair's hair's breath away from not I, going. Because I had heard that tale, 
once or twice before mm -hmm. the origin story, if you will. But yeah. I I don't remember hearing about the guy who was you originally supposed to go with and then backed yeah. out at the last minute. That was new. That was new to me. It was one of those details that I just like, it wasn't, you know, it, like he wasn't somebody in the fountain pen world. It was just kind of a tangential thing. So it wasn't like a central part of the story, I guess. But then like when I was prompted and I really thought about it again, the, the memory just kind of like popped yeah. back in my head. So it wasn't like I was ever intentionally trying to lead that. We were so close out, to the but, darkest timeline. I mean, it's very true. It just goes to show that like, <laughs> you never really know what little thing, what little event could mm -hmm. happen that could change the tra trajectory of something really important in your life. That's why I'm like, I'm a serial overcommitter because I've had so many things like that happen from just leaning in to sporadic opportunities where, you know, I, I have not regretted it. So I, I end up doing more things than are probably necessary because I don't want to- You don't wanna, say. I don't want to, yeah. <laughs> Understatement of the century, right? <laughs> you know what it also makes you do, Brian? It also makes you so difficult to, it also makes it impossible for you specifically to answer the question, what would you go back and do differently? Oh like yeah, because I'm like- You never answer, because you're like, well, one, it all led me here. One little tiny change could completely alter everything. So- Absolutely. You never have anything. It's like, the, what about butter, that the butterfly you, effect. Like if yeah, I go like, back and change any one you, thing, yeah. You whole injured life yourself different. horribly. You're like, nope, nope, I'll do it again. Like everything, because I'm, I'm here and I'm happy and all is well, so. Even the bad stuff, even the bad stuff that's happened has shaped where I've gotten. I just, I mean, yeah. this is how I, I don't know. It's hard to complain, so anyway. Thank you, Hannah. I'm glad you appreciated that little detail. I'd sort of forgotten about it myself, but um, uh, we were also pretty sleep deprived at the time, you know, baby on the way and whatnot. But then once the baby came, I was like, forget it. I thought I knew what tired was and then I had a kid and then I was like, oh, this is next level, next level tired. All right, Marie says, hi guys. I've been watching the pencast for a while. First time commenting. Hey, Marie, welcome to the commenting world. Say, say goodbye to lurking status. Um, thank you for the discussion on neurodivergence. Without mentioning too many details about myself, it feels good to see this is more commonly talked of. And we got a lot of responses um, from people with either they have or have people in their family or close to them, ADHD, dyslexia, autism. Of course, there's all different types of neurodivergence. Um, <laughs> true to form, Drew and I both forgot we'd actually kind of answered that question previously. Um, totally forgot about it. We were like, this is a great question. And then we genuinely just answered it from the heart as if we'd never answered it before. <laughs> and then after we recorded the pencast, Drew was like, hey, Brian, we totally have answered that like, basically exact question. I was like, well, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> Chances you know, are anybody with these issues probably give, forgot give, about yeah, it too. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> give, given the topic, that's, that's appropriate. You know, we're like, yep, well. Yeah, yeah, it is what it is, right? <laughs> yeah, and that's the kind of thing like normalizing it the more you talk about it. You know, it's not anything to be like stigmatized or anything. We won't discuss the whole topic again, but I'm really glad uh, that you're able to benefit from that as well as everybody else. So there's a lot of really, really good comments. We won't single too many people out here because again, it's kind of too much to share. But if you go back and look at the comments posted on YouTube from the last Pencast episode 53, um, lots of good stuff about their neurodivergence on there. So very cool topic and I'm glad to yeah, it feels like a very like community feedback uh, kind of episode that we had, Drew, last Definitely. week. Definitely. good stuff. All right, um, so that's what we got for feedback, and now we're gonna move on to some new stuff. All right, so kicking it off here. This is, I got something that's not coming in for a little while, so I have no idea why, but I'm starting off with the thing that's further out, and then I'm gonna talk about the things that we have now. So whatever, this is how we're doing it. Um, the Preppy Wah, so there's already been some Preppy Wah. These are like limited edition style, not numbered, but you know, special edition type preppies. A um, little bit more expensive than regular preppy, but not by much at all. Um, they're different colors, have some cool patterns to them. I won't break down every one because there's six new ones that are coming out, but they look pretty cool. If you go on the coming soon section of gulaypens.com, you'll see them. They're $7.80 each. Really affordable for a fountain pen. The preppy's a great pen. I think they're only in fine nib, but very cool in color. I have here one of the old preppy was uh, that uh, are the currently available. Um, I don't know, Drew, do you know if they're being replaced by these new ones or are they just adding to it? I don't quite know. I think I don't think that we uh, carry those anymore. I think those press are they going laws, I think they've come and gone. Okay, well, there you go. So if you want them, they are going to be limited in nature. What did we get the old ones? Like maybe a year ago, something like that? Um, I don't know. Somewhere, somewhere in that time frame. It's been since COVID. So um, definitely check those out when they come out. They'll be available in September. So I'm giving you a little bit of a heads up. 
Are you really going to track a $7.80 pen for two months? I don't know, but I'll, I'm sure I'll mention it again in September, forgetting that I ever talked about it now. Um, and then two pens uh, that we do have uh, in stock. We have a couple new ones from Benu. Um, I believe these ones were in development before they moved, um, but we did not uh, you know, get them in stock until now because moving is disruptive, especially moving countries. Um, so we have uh, two pens. We have Dream Bean and Four Leaf Clover. These are the Talisman models. Very popular, popular model. Very interesting. Lots of I'm not going to say, I guess texture, is texture the right word to use, Drew? It's got facets, but they're not facets all the way down the barrel. They like facet mm -hmm. and then they kind of turn a little bit. So I don't know, I've never seen any faceted pen that is shaped quite like this. It's very interesting, but it's very subtle too. So it's, you know, if you are more sensitive to textures and stuff like that, I don't think it's going to be like one of these, like, you know, making the back of your neck, you know, the chills feeling hair on the back of your neck. That's what I was going for. There's no, yeah, there's no sharp edges for sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not going to be like one of those type of things, but it's, it's got an interesting kind of texture to it that I find pretty interesting and kind of pleasant. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. I think it's but, delightful. Uh, and yeah. it, it is a popular model. I mean, the sales are doing really well with this model and all it of the is, talismans yeah. have a, a luck component to them and a whole story behind why oh, this yeah. element like is lucky in a particular culture. They're all really fascinating. They've got like about. this whole spread on the inside that covers, this one's four leaf clover. The other one is dream bean. Um, I knew nothing about the dream bean, so it's been pretty interesting to read about. I won't get all into it here, but you do get some nice knowledge packed into your pen here. And so th these pens, cool. in addition to the other talismans that we have, all actually have a component of the, you know, mandrake oh. or whatever infused or imbued into the acrylic of the pen itself. Yeah. Like every one of these has the talisman, the lucky charm, whatever it may be mm -hmm. in the pen somewhere, somehow. Yeah, which yeah, that's fitting with the the model name, right, talisman. Um, but it's interesting because, you know, I didn't even, they didn't quite sink in for me because I saw the four leaf clover and it's got like little clovery glitter in it. And I was thinking like, oh, okay, that's the clover. But no, there's like somewhere in here, you can't really see it, but somewhere in here is real four leaf clover. Apparently you can buy four leaf clover and it's what every one out of every five thousand clovers is a four leaf clover. I think we looked yeah, at that. Yeah, but that's, we that's that without fact. genetic modification. You know, we don't we don't have time for that. True. I don't know if they used organic four leaf clover or if these were genetically modified. I don't know that level of detail, but there is some kind of clover in there if that matters to you. I don't think it's. I just think it's a neat detail. Just the thought. Yeah, it is. They put and into all of cool. so all of these talismans are actually in a way, the thing that they're inspired by. So yeah. if you did want to carry around some Mandrake or some uh, uh, Edelweiss, you can do that <laughs> with a pen. Absolutely. It's pretty cool. You got a good story to tell. Um, and then the other pen that I have to mention, very excited about, Twisby, popular model, uh, popular brand. Uh, it's come out with a 580 with the Iris trim, just like you had the VAC 700R Iris. So this is a rainbow coated trim really nice looking i like this a lot it looks yes. really really cool clear pen with rainbow trim absolutely a nightmare to photograph our photographers were like wow this is taking like all the most difficult components of a pen to photograph but it looks pretty sharp and in real life it's 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 tight it looks really good it's got that like edge on the nib too with the rain not the whole that, rainbow that but just the edging so like good. just it looks really cool so definitely vibing with that so you can check those out i believe we're launching those on the day that we're launching this guest episode so if all goes to plan we should have those um yeah but pretty cool i don't know how long we'll have them i don't know if it's a special edition but i mean i think we're gonna have them for a little bit but i mean we still have we still have the vac 700 so still the vac 700 iris yeah but i mean like twisby's had some stock issues and stuff just like everybody has so they have um, been in and out at the beginning the vac 700 went pretty fast and we went, had to wait yeah. a little while for it a went, restock yeah. i don't know what situation we'll be in with these ones but i would say if you are like die hard set on getting one of these get on it sooner than later but I, it's not like if we sell out in the initial batch that we're we have no idea you know we're supposed to get some follow-up um shipments and stuff like that so i don't think you're gonna have to wait months or anything but you know it's gonna be kind of popcorn in and out kind of a thing so anyway that's what i got drew what you got i'm i'm going to repeat something because last mm. week we discussed sailor's new monyo inks and i hadn't yet used them I mentioned that I was going to use them. I was going That's to right. swab them on different types of paper and I would report back because I figured they would have some multi-tonal properties. And in fact, 
They do. Yeah, they, they do. They have right there on the side of the box, you know, multi shading or whatever, uh, two two tone shading. I think they say on the box, mm -hmm. and every single one of them, all four. I also I accidentally said eight. There's only four. I was looking at samples and bottles because I'm. Uh, eight, eight skews, eight, eight, eight individual skews, yes. products. Yeah. So oh, yeah, you know, I'm not totally wrong, but <laughs> all four have great, great chroma shading. Uh, properties and they all look really, really nice. So they at do. the very least, I would recommend checking out the samples because everybody should own at least one bottle of Sailor Chroma Shading Ink. It is an experience like none other. Just like you should mm -hmm. at least try something with heavy she sheening or try a mm -hmm. shimmer one day. This is the other thing you should try is a Chroma Shading Ink by Sailor. It's not every day an ink actually produces a totally different writing experience on the paper than these inks do and these inks do it. So if you haven't tried something like this or Neko Yonagi or Haha, ha, like check them out. It's, it's, it's worth a try for sure. Yeah. I'm digging it. I love it. And, and then, um, this one isn't really a new product. It's, it's something we just decided to start carrying, but the legendary iconic Pelican M1000 in black, it's just something that was missing from our site. Uh, and we were like, you know what, let's put this on there. It's not, a special edition or anything. Normally we do no. way better with the special editions, but it's yeah. it's it's the icon, right? So mm -hmm. we went ahead and have it up there. So well, they it's don't there do, now. Yeah, they, they do special editions of the 400, 600, even the 800 on a somewhat regular basis. They really don't do many specials of the 1000. So it was kind of like years would go by before we'd have any M1000. And it was like, okay, well, let's at least have something there. So they really don't have a lot of colors of the M1000. So we had to go with the standard you know, least exciting colors of it, but it's, you know, but, but it, it actually the started is from phenomenal. Yeah. It actually started from the comment section of YouTube. Brian did the video on like top seven pens to last a lifetime. And he mentioned mm -hmm. the M1000 and it was one of the few pens on that list that we actually didn't sell. And mm. people were like, wait, what about this one? And yeah, I'm like, okay, well, sure. <laughs> it's, it's there now. All right. Yeah. I think I might have shown I, I might have shown the one I had that which was a limited edition one. You showed the um, green ray, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah. So it's like we'll yeah. get like one or two of yeah. those every time they do, you know. So it's like not exactly widely available, and those ones are rotten and they're way priced way higher than a normal they're one. So good looking though. Oh my god, it's pretty good. That would be their flagship model, if I had to say. Mm -hmm. All right, that's it for the new stuff. You can always check out new stuff coming soon, new arrivals, whatever you want to call it, um, on GoodlyPens.com. It's a great place to keep up with it. You can sign up for email notifications if you want to get a heads up exactly when we get stuff in because it does send out to that list. We don't do pre-orders or hold stuff or anything like that, but we'll at least give you a heads up as soon as we put it in stock. All right, now moving on, we got some Q and A. All right, Brian, something weird happened last week. Did it now? We got not one, but two questions on Instagram mm -hmm. about why the Lamy Emporium isn't more popular. Two and completely we, independent completely, questions. Unless it's the same person just get with two different profiles, but I doubt I, it. And I was like, okay, this ha we have to mention this because this is too freaky not to mention. Hmm. So uh, Mercedes and Dennis both asked, why isn't the Lamy Emporium more popular? Uh, like. So it's a pretty simple question with a simple answer, I guess. But yeah, I just, I just felt like the universe was telling me that we needed to talk about this. So I Apparently. just wanted to go with it. I didn't want to anger any you know deities I was unaware of. There you go. Um, okay, so I mean we can talk about the Emporium. Um, you know, it's it's a pen that like I mean, it's, I don't know. I I was reading some blogs and stuff, just trying to educate myself a little bit more about it. I mean, we've carried it since it came out, but, um, you know, just trying to get other people's opinions and perspectives and stuff like that. Reading do reviews. We, do we carry it now though? It. Yeah. Yeah. We do. Yeah. I believe so. Oh, I'll check it out. Um, <laughs> now you got me, you got me wondering. We should. All right. Well, you keep talking. I'm going to seem like a dum dumb if I don't have it. Oh, maybe we don't. Really? Oh gosh, maybe we discontinued it because it doesn't sell. <laughs> uh, that might be the case. Well, in that case, um, you know, I have nothing against the Emporium. It's an acquired taste. Um, so I think the price has a lot to do with it. It's definitely one of Lamy's most expensive pens. Uh, mm. I think it, it might be the most expensive pen that they currently offer with the exception of like special the, editions. And you hear those stuff. Arushi dialogues, yeah. The Arushi dialogues are like any of the special edition 2000s and that kind of thing. but. Um, you know, it's, the price has a lot to do with it. You know, it's got the, 
it's got a wonderful nib on it, that 14 karat gold Lamy nib. Good nib. Dip, yeah, it's a good nib, but you can get that nib on a lot of other pens. Like, not a lot, but you can get it on certain studios. You can get it on other certain special editions and things like that. And and in some places, you can even buy that nib separately and then put it on basically whatever Lamy pen you want, except the 2000. Um, the Dialogue 3 has got it. So, you know, you can get that same writing experience on a less expensive pen. So that's part of it. Um, the grip itself is probably the part that stands out the most. Very unconventional. It's got that kind mm. of like ribbed, bubbly kind of a grip mm. that's also tapered. So it's... Definitely an acquired taste on the grip side of things. I did not um, acquire it. So if, you, uh, if you're familiar with a pen from the 90s called the Lamy Persona, it looks similar to that. So I think it was sort of a re-inspired version of that. Um, that one had a different nib. That one had a nib that the wings of it actually wrapped all the way around, just like the Lamy Lady, which I have, I have one of each of those. Um, and those nibs were really cool, but they don't make those anymore. So they kind of reimagined the persona and uh, it became the Emporium. I don't dislike the pen, but you know, I love that nib. I think it's a good writer, but the grip is, 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 a, is a bit weird. You know what um, it reminds me of? It reminds me of those old, like, you know, sci-fi robots from the, you know, mid century. Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. The arms, you know, yep. the, the, the rubbery, like yep. danger will Roberts, uh, Robbins, Robbins. Robinson, Will you're Robinson. On, you're on your own on this one. Crap. Don't grab onto me. I Danger Will Robinson. I can't, I can't yeah, swim in it's the Robinsons. It's the Robinsons. Yeah. It's lost in space. There you go. Sure. Golly. Thinking like Christopher Robin or something. Christopher like Robbins. <laughs> Danger, Christopher Robbins. <laughs> poo in space. Wow. Hey, everybody's got a poo. Yeah. Um. So yeah, uh, it's a metal pen. Pretty. You know, it's fairly decent size. It's 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 not huge in diameter, but it's it's a very dense pen, so it's really heavy. Yeah. Um, so we didn't really get a lot of complaints about it once people got it, if they liked it, but we definitely had people that were like, why is this pen so expensive? So, if, you know, it seems like we don't have it anymore. Yeah. Seems like I should know that, but um, <laughs> apparently I didn't think as much of the pen to even care to check on that before I did this. I just assumed we still had it, but... Um, if you're really interested in it and you want us to bring it back, let us know and we will if there's a groundswell of interest. But uh, I think there's just so many other alternatives, especially good Lamy pens um, that, uh, you know, it's pretty easy to pass it over. So nothing against it, not knocking it, but, you know, we're only going to carry stuff if people want us to want us to sell it. So uh, that's kind of where we're at. And Drew, I love your notes that you put in here. Drew left literally one bullet point in the notes. And he just says, because it's UG. That's it. It's UG. I too. have my opinions. So you only you're in that camp, huh? It's I fine. don't like that. It's, it's weird. It's like it's like a pug or a chihuahua. You know, it's like <laughs> it's kind of cute, but in a interesting way. Yeah, yeah. It's that yeah. it's that grip that does it for me. That's just like I don't. Yeah. Norm, normally, German pens are so practical in their design, and yeah, that grip is like, what what happened? <laughs> Why did you decide not know. to German? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, Lamy, a lot of times, I don't know specifically this pen. A lot of times they will go with designers that are specifically not from like the pen world because they want to get, uh, you know, kind of outside yeah. influence. So it could have been, you know, the original grip when they did the persona. I don't know the history of the persona, um, but it could have been that they collabed with somebody who, you know, wasn't in the Lamy sphere and they were trying to just get something different and they sure got it. So anyway. If you want that pen, you can't get it from us. So go buy it somewhere else. <laughs> Next question. Uh, this is from New Life Leather Works, I would assume. It got cut off, but Leather Works. Uh, what is the most popular ink slash color for each brand? Oh. This is like its own video topic here. It is. It is. Well, we're not going to discuss our favorites, but based on data, we do have inks, colors, that sit atop the heap of mm. every brand's sales. Mm -hmm. I have mm -hmm. them right here. Oh, now, so. now, okay, we gotta, we gotta just clarify a little bit because we do sell both bottles and samples. Sometimes mm -hmm. we sell multiple sizes of a given bottle. That's so correct. Like, how did you compile this data? Did you take all of that into account? Is it by volume? Well, Is it by revenue? Like, what's I, the? I used a very advanced, statisticky, oh, calculating. Boy program named could, Jeremy. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> it's, it's the name of my computer, my, my highly advanced 
right. self-aware computer. Okay. Al- a human, Al- a, Al- a Al- human Al- who Al- knows computers, yes. Algum rhythm. Um, <laughs> so, no, our data analyst, Jeremy, provided me with this. You can, so, envision yes, Jer- I- you can envision Jeremy as a robot with those ribbed arms that, <laughs> that you have on the, the Lamy uh, Emporium. Yeah, uh, so he is including um, uh, not samples, but okay. multiple sizes of each bottle. So these okay. are bottle sales. So full bottles. That's more of a commitment than just a sample. I think yeah, exactly. Good. So these are full bottle sales, but we are including, you know, 30 mil, 60 mil, whatever. If we have multiple, okay. you know, like Dymine has multiple bottle sizes. Yeah. So we're including yeah. all that. That's good. Okay. So um, what do you think Aurora's top color is, Brian? Well, they only have three, so I got a 33.3333% chance mm-hmm. of getting this right. I know previously it was Aurora Black, but they came out with a blue black a couple of years ago, and I'm gonna say that just because it seems more interesting than black. Should have gone with your gut, buddy. It is, is it Aurora black? black. Dang it, okay. All right, what about Colorverse? Colorverse, oh my gosh, there's so many colors. Yeah, you want me to just give you this one? You're not gonna get it. I mean, I know Quasar is popular, and it's like a dark blue. That's kind of where I would guess Quasar. Uh, it is actually Extreme Deep Field. Okay, so from from the uh, similar, season seven collection. Similar color, but yeah, okay. Mm, it will. It's Extreme Deep Field plus NGC eighteen fifty. But that Extreme Deep Field is the that's the banger. That that's the okay. one that looks super good. But Fair no, enough. there's no way I would have gotten that either. I know you're going to get Deatrementis though. Give me Deatrementis. Uh, I don't know that I'm going to get it. I'm not 100% confident. Yeah, you De- are. Document Black. You are correct. Okay. They have a lot of very interesting colors. Dude, Document but... Black kills it. Is that Document one like clear Black. front oh, runner? Sh- okay. Yeah, dude. Document right. Black. That, that's a sweet ink. You'll probably right. get Dime Mine too. Well, I so this one I kind of cheated because I remembered when we did our top inks of last year. Uh, this is, it, I got Jeremy to pull the last six months. Okay. So we'll see if it held strong, then it's Writer's Blood is the top color. Writer's Blood been. remains Remains at top? Okay. Yes, sir. Well, it might come back then in our top inks of 2022. All right, I'm not even gonna bother you with Diplomat, but it's black. Oh, okay. So, yeah. I didn't um, even think about Fer- that one. Ferris yeah. Wheel Press, newer brand for us. I was not um, confident about this one at all. Tumbling Time Blue is the only one I thought maybe. No, no, but you're, you're, not, you're not way off. I believe Tumbling Time Blue is one of their newer limited things, okay. um, as is Roaring Patina Black. Um, so okay. that's the black with the shimmer. Gotcha. So, uh, yeah, that is the most popular. And okay. uh, Erbon, that one, this one surprised me. So, do I, are we talking Jacques Erbon and Erbon, like all of it together, or is it just the like 30 mil Erbon? Just the 30 colors? mil Erbon. I guess Pearl Noir. You are correct. Okay. I wouldn't have gotten that one. I would have said uh, Poussard de Lune. That one's pretty popular, but Eclat de Saphir was always more popular than that one. Yeah, okay. Um, okay, now Pearl we're now, now Pearl Noir, now we're this with... is going off like 10 years ago data. Pearl Noir was always Hey, yeah, hey, you're, you're, you're working it, you're working it. What about Jacques Herbal? Uh Emerald of Chavor, no question. Boom, boom. You no know question. it. Yeah. You know it. Lamy. Ooh, this one's tough. I said Crystal Azurite. Oh, BG. Did I get it? Coming at it, yeah, man. Yeah? Yeah. Nice. I wouldn't. I definitely wouldn't have. Wouldn't have. I don't know any of these. Uh, what about that Mont- one was tough? That one was tough because the crystals yeah. are, are significantly more expensive than the regular line. Yeah, dude. No, good call. Good call. All right. All um, right. And these are these are by volume, not by revenue. Okay. So fair quantity sold, not by how much they are. Like by uh, Monteverde- milliliter. So- I'm just kidding. Not <laughs> in the volume. Monteverde. Ooh, Horizon Blue. Close. Yeah. I know you'll get it with your second one though. Oh. Uh. Shoot. I don't know. What is it? California teal. California teal. Okay. Yeah, it's probably close because I know Horizon Blue is super popular. They're both. They're both really good colors. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about Noodlers? Uh, Noodlers black. X feather. X feather. Okay. X feather. It was always like black X feather and Heart of Darkness yep. has always been like competing for top. Yep. Okay. Organic Studios, obviously nitrogen. Nitrogen. So that, that's not a even giveaway. a question. Yep. Not even. A what question. about Pelican? And uh, oh, this one's tough. I said brilliant golden. brown. I said, oh, please. Um, <laughs> golden Barrel? You no, know, you're going to be surprised to hear that it is Moonstone. Really? Okay. I mean, it is newer, I guess. It's got the hype yeah, train behind it's, it. Yeah, it's more last, of a special color, yeah. Yeah, okay. last year would have been Golden Barrel for sure. We had, I know sto- you're get... we had a lot of stock issues of Golden Barrel, so that yeah. that's why I had a question. No, I didn't have a question mark. I had a question mark in my brain about that one. 
And Irojizuku is? Kanpeki. Of course it is. Easy, easy. Easy. I'm just going uh, to say, I don't dictate <laughs> these. Obviously, you all are actually buying these. I'm just so pleased with how many of these are just blues that right fall right into the <laughs> color range of what I love. Like, that's not like we're pushing blues all that hard. I mean, I am. But like, this is like, of all the inks that we're selling, 800 colors. Look how many of them are. Uh, it's a crime like that a, there's no browns on here. Gorgeous cobalt blue. Anyway, all this right. makes me uh, really happy. I think platinum is going to be an easy one too. Uh, I put carbon black. Yeah, man. Carbon black all day long. Yep, yep. Which between that and document black, like that shows us that people really do value that and X feather. So you've Those, got X feather, yeah. carbon black, and document black. All three very utilitarian blacks that actually perform you know, a task that you buy it for. So well, then you got Aurora cool. black, you've got Urban, yeah, Pearl Noir. Um, yep. Private did. Reserve uh, surprised me. I wouldn't have guessed this one. Yeah, I guess DC yeah. Super Show blue. I, I would have guessed something along those lines either, yeah. but it is actually plum. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Private Reserve plum. I would never have guessed that. that Neither would, yeah, that, that really caught me off guard. Huh, okay. Mm -hmm. I guess we're, we need to get on the plum train, Drew. You, you probably will get Robert Oster in three guesses. Oh. There's so many Robert Oster colors that are interesting and cool. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I I guess Blue Water Ice because I talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's not quite, that not quite, but close. Not quite. Okay, that's not surprising. Oh my gosh! I know Rose Gold Antique was pretty popular, but it it's is kind of specific. So I wouldn't think that it would be that. But that's just it one that comes to mind. It is pretty specific. Yeah. Oh my gosh! No other specific one is coming to mind. Fire and ice. Fire and ice. That's so close. It to the is. Blue water I know. Ice. I know. But Robert Oster has a lot of banging blues. It's a good one. Fire and ice yep. is a good color. And that one was the OG. That came out before Blue Water Ice. It did. It did. So, it slaps, as the kids uh, say. It's got a little more sheen. This sheen's a little heavier on Fire and Ice. So it's pretty good. It's I pretty get good. it. But the shading on Blue Water Ice is so good. It's so it is. Good. I mean, that's the thing. <sighs> People. You could draw criticism at Robert Oster for having too many blues, but they're no. all so good. They're all really good. I know. <laughs> all really good. They can they can eat into each other a little bit, but yeah, that's they all, right. all still look really good. Anyway. They do. And okay. Roarer and Cleaner. Ooh, I put Salix. Good, good one. Uh, but it is indeed Alt Gold Gloom. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I mean, that's a that's a very interesting color it's a it's unique i think that's the color it's definitely that unique roar and cleaner does that isn't yeah. easily uh you can't easily find a clone no elsewhere. yeah no other color i think urban might have a color that's probably the closest to that um very olive maybe or maybe there's another olivey kind of a yellow ink that i'm thinking of that's close to that but there's not a lot of companies that make an ink in that color mostly because i think the color is kind of ugly but the shading on it is so interesting that i it, really like it yeah it, it stands does out do yeah really good shading interesting noodler's so, golden brown is kind of like that lighter yeah, brown with good yeah. shading but I, I definitely prefer old gold for sure yeah old, and D diamond's got a couple of colors like that too like you know I mean, I guess not to that same degree, but you have like an autumn oak or something like that. That's a little mm -hmm. more in like the orangey brown kind of yeah, family. It is a but I think orangey. I think it's the same kind of thing. Like that color alone itself would not be most people's pick, but because of what it does, it's kind of interesting. Anyway. Yeah, if it was more flat, then probably yeah. not. But it does do this beautiful shading, so it's good. Yeah. And then Sailor, I know you're going to get Sailor. I guess Monyo Haha. You are correct. Yeah. The yeah, Ink man. Studio 123 is also really popular, but the, I think the the Manyo has got to do it. I'm interested yep. to see how these new Manyos do though, because they're pretty cool. I know, they really and are. they've got that multi-tonal thing going on. That's why people like Haha. -ha, so. Yeah, I like uh, Fuji mm -hmm. is a really good one in that line, mm -hmm. but they're all fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, Twisby is Twisby Black, so. Yeah, you know, that's what whatever. I thought, yeah. Yeah. Black. Whatever, I'll give you, I'll give you points on that one. Yeah. Uh, and then Visconti, that's kind of easy. Oh gosh, uh, is that blue, right? Yeah, yeah, it's blue. Blue, okay. Yep, dude, you only got like four wrong. That's like tremendous. Yeah, that is absolutely Ken, tremendous. Ken tremendous over here. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, so just so just so you know, Drew. Just so oh. you know. Oh, okay. We're gonna. So, are you gonna are you gonna slip in a deep dive without telling? No, me? No, 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 no. I'm just I'm gonna go about okay. my my thought process here okay. for how I went about this. I, so I I did look at our website just so I could just so I could be refreshed because like oh that's fine. Trying to remember off the top of my head is is really. But you didn't hard. look at the back end. You looked at. No, no, no. I looked at the front know. end of the website. Yeah, you know, that's that's fine. That's but not cheating. The thing is when I when I filtered and I looked at Aurora, I realized that the default view that it showed was best selling. And I thought that that would give an unfair advantage. 
So, and that's as best selling as of like currently. So it wouldn't necessarily give me the top answer, but I felt like it would be kind of cheating a little bit. So after I looked at Aurora, but it had Aurora blue black as first anyway, that's not why I chose it, but it did have that listed first. So it was wrong immediately um, based off of the time frame that you're pulling this. Um, but even still, because I realized if I looked at it through the like product section of the website, and it would default to best selling. I actually went over to the swab shop and I looked it up because I knew it would not filter it by Look at you being sales. all honest so and to stuff. To maximize my integrity, How I, just, I looked that? at every brand in the swab no, shop, looked was... through all the colors, and then just from memory, wrote down the ones that I thought that, were That is pretty tops. super. I, I don't know if, uh, I mean, I don't know if Rachel would have gotten 100% of these. Oh, I probably. Think she, she probably would. She's phenomenal at that. You think she would have gotten plum? I don't know. She she I don't know. she can look at spreadsheets of data and just remember I it. I know. You know, so it's like I, I, re I remember this from like using it and talking about it and producing videos, like ask, all this after, kind of stuff. After like, this, ask her about PR. I bet she'd probably get most all the rest of these. PR is the only one that I think might trip her up. That one would, yeah, that one would be tough. I don't know about, right. yeah, like Robert Oster too would be kind of tough. I don't know. Yeah, ask her about does, PR and report back to us next week, okay? Okay, we'll see All if right. I remember. I won't remember. Okay, <laughs> okay. We'll see. you want to move see. on to the next one? <laughs> yeah, let's do it. Okay, so Doe1313 asks an interesting mm. question about mm. Machia. I love Machia pens and they range from $25 to $10,000. Please explain the differences. Mm. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, they can go over ten thousand dollars, so yeah, they oh can yeah, go, they can go higher than that. They can um, go, but all the you way. know, still the point is made. Uh, they can be expensive. I'm just realizing now I'm kind of like answering two questions in a row here, Drew. So I don't know how you spun that one on me, but <laughs> oh, <laughs> you put me on the spot. No, it was technically your question, the last one, but I ended up having to be the one to do a lot of the work. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I was I was it. like answering it, but you were I was quizzing you while you I was answering me. it. It's fine. Yeah. I'm just I, my commentary. plan my plan was to just answer it, but I guess it, it thought I know I kind of got excited about it. I kind of Yeah. I kind of wiggled my way in there, so it's fine. Oh, no, it's all right. And now I'm blaming you for it. Don't you like that? That's <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. I'm sorry. All right. Um okay, so Machia pens 25 10k or more. Um yeah, so First off, I'm gonna say $25. What the heck pen is $25 with Machia? I don't even know what. <laughs> you know, I, I think I've pen... seen some like, uh, you know. Uh, like maybe wanna... like in Japan, the like absolute cheapest Didn't... pen you can get with like, not even real Machia, but like no. stickers basically that are put yeah, on Yeah, it. it's gonna be those stickers. Like stickers I mean, I guess... with lacquer over it. I guess technically like, so I've been to Japan once and I went to like a couple stationary stores. They have more or less like dis maybe not disposable pens, but like, you know, preppy level of quality pens there. Yeah. They're, they're mass produced pens like that. And they're not like hand painted Machia, I would assume, but they have like, I don't, I don't know exactly how they produce it, but they have some kind of Machia where it's like little, little dots or flowers or something that are just like kind of sprinkled on it. Or it's like a screen printing, essentially, sort of process. It's like a, I think it's a screen printed sticker that gets put on and then maybe one layer of lacquer over it. Maybe, uh, I don't know. maybe. It's, it's, so yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what- They can call it Machia for sure, but, and I've definitely seen things like that. So that's probably yeah, what you're yeah. talking about. And like the, the most affordable ones that we've ever sold, I don't, there's no $25 Machia in the US that I've ever seen. So I don't think that you can- Not get, one that should definitely be called Machia for sure. Yeah, I'm not aware of any. Doesn't mean they don't exist, but none of them that we've ever seen from any brand we've carried at least. Um, so I will say, um, mm -hmm. You know, what I what I would consider to be Machia is like actually hand applied stuff like that. Like the least expensive one I've ever seen has been like the Platinum Modern Machia or the Kanazawa Leaf Machia that have been in like the one one fifties to like two fifties range. But even those and those are, are the ones that are like, like they're applied and then just like lacquered over. Basically, they're not yeah. they're not hand painted with the thing on the barrel. Yes, it's applied by hand technically, but you know, and they're gold nib pens too. So it's like, that's a good price. Even if it didn't have any Machia on it, yeah. that's a good price for those types of pens. Um, but I've never seen anything as low as 25. But either way, the nature of the question is like, why is there such a massive range in price for Machia? I think that's the heart of the question here, which is fine. Um, so I think there's a couple of basically different factors at play. One of them is a small factor. One of them is a, the biggest factor. 
So the, the smaller factor, which is still important, is basically what's the underlying pen and nib that the maquillage is being applied to. Because maquillage is a, it's a finishing technique, right? So it's a Urushi lacquer and you know, you're, you're putting something onto a pen. You have to have some canvas for which to do the artwork, right? So whatever the pen is, you're not gonna have a maquillé pen of any type that's less expensive than the base model of the pen, right? So if you have a pen that's, you know, got some kind of whatever, rodden with Urushi lacquer or vanishing point, you would assume it's gonna be much more expensive than a regular vanishing point because you're starting with a vanishing point and you're, you know, spending more time adding more value to it. So the underlying pen is, gives you a kind of a starting point. You know, if you have a pen like the Namiki Emperor, well, the plain, plain black Yurushi lacquer version of an emperor is $2,000. So you're basically starting with a $2,000 pen and then applying more stuff on top of it. So it's gonna be more than $2,000, right? So I think, uh, but you can still get, you know, say a Kanazawa leaf from platinum for the 200-ish dollar range. I don't remember exactly what the price is off the top of my head, 216 or something like that, I don't remember, but you know, so that's a much lower price pen than you're starting with for something like a Namiki Emperor. So the base pen is a factor, but it's not the biggest factor. The biggest factor is the time and the complexity of the Maquillet work itself. So if you have a pen with $10,000 <laughs> worth of value to it, yes, the pen itself is gonna be really nice, but it's going to have just a ton of time and talent that's involved in creating that pen. You're gonna have much more intricate work, many more techniques probably, a blend of different techniques that are done on a given pen. And they're gonna be extremely limited too. These are not pens that are gonna even be capable of being mass produced because they have to be done by trained artisans of which there are really not that many, uh, a handful really in the world who can do this type of work, especially on a pen, something as small as a pen. Um, and uh, m you know, the vast majority of these are gonna come out of Japan. Um, and so that is definitely their like treasured heritage over there is that technique. Um, they'll train for literal years before they even get the opportunity to work even in a group on some of these pens. And then let alone if you're a kind of a solo artist, an individual artist being featured on like a Namiki pen, you know, those pens, you're not going to get one for less than probably six grand, you know, and they go up from there. But the techniques you see on them, the number of layers of lacquer are just mind blowing. I mean, you can literally feel the texture on the pen because um, you know they've they've built up layers if it's a flower and it's got you know rounded petals they'll build up layers and you'll actually have like a kind of a 3d contour kind of shape on each petal that goes around so it's it's all that and you're gonna have things like quail eggshell and abalone shell and silver and gold dust and different burnishing techniques different colors of lacquer with different relief and all these types of things so it's very very intricate. It's built up in many, many different layers that um, it can't be rushed. I mean, some of these pens l literally take months to be able to produce a final output of one pen. Now they'll make them in like kind of batches and they'll do like one stage at a time, but it takes, you know, maybe a week to cure each layer in between. So like you, if you made one pen or made, you know, 40 pens, you can't do it any faster than say four months just because of how long it takes to cure every single layer of that lacquer and it really can't be rushed. Not only that, but the way this lacquer cures, this Yurushi lacquer, it cures with a very specific range of humidity. So it has to be humidity controlled. So there are certain times of the year, even that they're working, that the lacquer will not cure or won't cure nearly as quickly because there's not enough humidity. So they can try to like artificially kind of, you know, control that humidity, but that becomes a challenge in certain times. So their even their ability to produce these year round is challenged just by the nature of how this material cures. So it's extremely fascinating <laughs> as you get deeper into it, just everything that's involved with these pens. Um, but essentially, if you think about it in terms of how intricate is it, and it's basically how much time and talent has gone into producing these pens, that is the majority of what you're paying for. And then the end result, you can see once you, especially if you kind of study up on them a little bit, the average person, you know, just looking at these pens would be like, wow, that's a really fancy looking pen. Wow, how many thousands of dollars is that? That's crazy, yeah. You know, and they won't learn any deeper, but if you learn more and think about, it's literally some skilled artisan that's crouched over this pen, going like this with a tiny little brush and like all their tools are handmade. These are not produ mass produced things. I mean, they like take like badger hair brushes and all this. They make all their own tools out of bamboo and that. And just for years and years and years of 
studying and training and that kind of stuff. They learn these techniques to do this very intricate work. And um, it's somebody that's just, you know, going at it over a very long period of time. So it's, it's your, you're essentially funding that art, you're funding that artisan um, and keeping that tradition kind of alive. And so when you hold one of these pens in your hand, yes, it looks beautiful. But when you think about like, oh my gosh, every single speck of dust was applied intentionally by hand by this skilled person who's probably been doing this for 20 to 30 years. You're like, wow, this is this is a really special work of art. So um, there you go. So the more of that that's involved, the more expensive it is. Supply and demand, they can't produce that many of them. It takes a lot of work and time and talent to be able to do it. These artisans only have so many hours in a day, so they can only make so many pens. So that helps to dictate the price. Yes, indeed. And more often than not, the larger pens have the larger nibs, which drives up price. And because they're larger pens, they have a larger mm -hmm. canvas yep. for getting all that art on there. And more mm -hmm. art means higher price. So it's just, yeah. you know, the larger pens are going to be more expensive for mm -hmm. a couple of different reasons. But it's important to have, you know, some... I'll call them more affordable Machier pens too, because think about it, it's like any other trade craft. You'll have like your master craftsmen, these artisans who, you know, have trained for years and can do the really, really intricate stuff. But, you know, it's nice for you to be able to kind of like work your way up as a collector to get to those ones. Um, so it's nice to have some lower price ones that, you know, those who are apprentices and are, can kind of work in a group and all that, they can do some of the, call it less skilled versions of Machier and some of the lower price pens more people can get Machia in their hands and appreciate that. And then, you know, they can build up their skills, eventually become sort of the masters and create nicer pieces of art. You know, so it's a, it's, a, it's good to have a mix of all of it, but you know, with that much skill and that much of everything that's involved, you know, the range does go quite a bit, but it's not just pens either. I mean, we know about it mainly from the pen world, but I mean, Machia work is, is something, you know, Yurushi artwork is something that is done I would say even primarily not in the pen world. They're doing all kinds of stuff, dishware, furniture, you know, all kinds of ornamental items. Um, and so, yeah, the, the fact that it's done in pens is really interesting, but uh, it's much, much bigger technique that's practiced outside of this the pen world. So, very cool. Yes, great, indeed. Great question, love it. All right, got a question from Potter Watch 221B. Well, just kicked my camera too. Um, for Drew. If each Avenger, OG 2012 Avengers to narrow it down, a fountain pen and or ink, which would dot, dot, dot. I'm assuming you can fill in the blanks on this question. Basically, what pen and ink would these Avengers use? And I'm going to go take a nap because I've... Do I have to answer this? Because I really don't want to. It doesn't <laughs> excite me at all. I've right. never even, I don't even know who the Avengers are. I think this is the longest I've ever seen your notes in one of these questions of anything we've been asked before. For me, this is just a regular question, but... <laughs> well, I, I don't want to not take this seriously, Brian. I mean, this is a very serious question with serious yeah, we, implications. We get, I've already we, had my I've already had my nerd card revoked because of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So mm -hmm. I'm I take this seriously, okay? So Okay. Well now I get to do I get to put on the, the brave Drew face. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, uh-huh. Uh -huh. All right. Well what do you mean by Avengers? Uh <laughs> <laughs> that depends. <laughs> no, but but uh, we do have it clarified to the uh, 2020, 2012 uh, movie, okay. so that actually does help. Okay. Okay. So let's go with Captain America first, shall we? He's an American, lost a man out of time, if you will. Let's go ahead and go with an Edison Collier in Azure Skies. It's 100% married mm. in America. There's no frills. It's hardy. It's a larger pen, and it's blue like he is. However... Keep in mind, Homeboy is from the 40s, so he has actually used plenty of vintage pens just in his normal everyday life. So coming in here, he probably wants to pick up a vintage pen from way back when. But since we're going with, you know, pens I'm more familiar with, let's just go with that one. Uh, so there you have it. And moving on to Bruce Banner. And I'm saying Bruce Banner, not Hulk, yes. So. You could go with Hulk and say something gigantic and green, but let's be real, Hulk is not using a fountain pen. And in fact, Bruce Banner is the most likely to actually be a fountain pen nerd like us of this group. Like he's, he's gonna be the actual fountain pen guy of the group for sure. So we're gonna go with the Lamy 2000 for old Bruce Banner because even though Hulk isn't using this pen, this pen needs to survive a Hulk out. So. What if, he's, also, what if he's holding the pen when he turns into the hole? Uh, you know, 
I, I believe in the Lamy 2000, but I don't know if I believe in it that much. But either way, it, it, it's it's resilient. It's a resilient pen, but also it's you know a pen a fountain pen aficionado would look forward to using and care about, and he would do his research on. So it's a practical pen for a pen person, but also resilient enough to survive you know a couple Hulk outs here and there. So um, yeah, definitely wouldn't want a disposable one, even though that would be practical for the Hulk instances. I think Bruce Banner's too much of a potential fountain pen guy to go with the disposable pen. Mm. Moving on to Thor. Now, if Bruce Banner was the most likely to be a fountain pen person, Thor is the least likely to be a fountain pen person. Uh, he honestly wouldn't use it, let's be honest. He's not gonna use a fountain pen. <laughs> he would just want the largest, most obnoxious thing he could have, so mm. that um, probably the heaviest and most unruly pen we have, which is the Jin Hao 999 Jin Hao Dragon. Dragon. Yes, <laughs> awesome. because all, all, all he'd want to do would be to like, hey, 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 look at my pen, and they'd be like, oh, this is too heavy and awkward. Hmm. It's fine for me. Drew, you know. you know what else? You know what other pen I'm thinking of? Uh, what? The Monograppa Chaos, maybe? Or the, or the Monograppa Pirate? I mean, that is a marvelous pen, but- uh, I'm saying. Yes, yeah, no, for sure, for sure. Uh, we don't carry either of those. I wish we did because- If Avid Fountain Pen user Stilestra Stallone is good enough for him- We can't even order those, Brian. Like, uh, don't, oh, don't know, tease like me. Outdated. You know I yeah, like yeah. those pens. I know you do. <laughs> uh, dang it, my heart. But that's like, uh, uh, that's like, that's about the only thing I can think of that's like even a step above. Oh yeah, he, he wants something you know, unwieldy like his hammer. He, he, loves, yeah. he loves showing off how no one else can pick up his hammer. He'd want to do the same thing with his pen. If you pick up the chaos pen, you're like, oh, ooh, he'd be like, mm, works fine for me. I think it feels great. <laughs> I think it's perfect. It might be a little too light. So, you know, that, that, that's Thor, that's Thor. Uh, Black Widow, uh, she might use some fountain pens actually. I went mm. with the Pilot Vanishing Point LS in matte black because mm. it's stealthy and tough. And has that tiny that little, little red, bit of that red. Red yes. accent. Yes, yes, exactly. It looks like a that Black is, Widow. Exactly. It is perfect for Black Widow. I had to pick that one. Mm. Um, for Hawkeye, I don't think he's going to be using a fountain pen. He's a very, very down to earth, practical person. Um, uh, you, you could go with something like the saying? Sailor Wicked Witch because. What are you saying? Fountain pens are practical. Uh, he, he doesn't even, like, you, you, if you look at, like, his, the, his he doesn't. He's not a fountain pen person. <laughs> he's not a fountain pen person. He's he's just he's a very that that's no no and also <laughs> fountain pens are not anyway get out of here Brian. Um, <laughs> he would he's not concerned with looks at all. He would not want anything like you could go with the sailor nineteen the uh, wicked witch of the west because it's kind of purpley and black and his is kind of purpley and black. Um, I thought about the Lamy LS though because he would want something that could be easily weaponized and the Lamy LS has a st it has a metal finial with that cross in it that he could probably knock and shoot. However, the LS is also super light and would not fly through the air out of his bow very well. Hmm. So in fact, I went with the Monteverde Regatta, which if you take the, if the back of the Regatta has a massive like chunky metal handle, for lack of a better term, it's weighty. If you grab that thing like a throwing knife, you could chuck that thing and Hawkeye specifically could do some damage with the regatta. That's all he would care about. He'd be like, okay, well, which one can I kill the most people with? And um, their e nibs are easily replaced. So after he throws it a couple times, he can replace the nib, put it back in his bandolier or whatever, and wow. you know, have another have another go. So Hawkeye would just look for something lethal. So that's what uh, that's what he's gonna go with is the Monte Monteverde regatta. Um, and then finally, Iron Man. There used to be a red and gold vanishing point, Brian. Do you remember that? I do remember that, yeah. It was pretty, pretty Iron Man-y. Um, mm -hmm. But we mm -hmm. no longer have that one. So, And also, just because it looks like Iron Man doesn't mean that that's what Tony Stark would use. Tony Stark mm. actually might use some fountain pens. Maybe not as much as Bruce, but he would own some. Like You know he owns a fountain pen. I thought that Tony Stark would want something, because he is a very, very elaborate person he likes mm. to throw his money around but also he is a machinist and an engineer so he would want something that kind of bridges the gap between opulence and engineering and kind of detail-oriented craftsmanship so i picked a st dupont guilloche uh firehead uh, mm. line d in the red because that also is reddish and gold yeah and the guilloche is very very intricate especially once you like realize how they do it and how they use machines to do it it really kind of 
bridges that gap between kind of something machining uh, centric and also, you know, SD DuPont is very luxurious as well. So I think that is my Iron Man pen. That's it. Nice. That's the, that's the original team, Brian. That's pretty solid, Drew, I gotta say. Thank you very much. I think we need to get some corporate sponsorships going on here. I need to talk to Marvel. Marvel? Marvel. It's Marvel. Get me Marvel. Get me Marvel. Mr. or Mrs. Marvel, please. Yep. Is that Disney? Disney owns Marvel now, right? Disney owns everything. Yes, sir. Okay. That's what I thought. How many Marvel? They finally, many... finally own, they finally own uh, X-Men now, too, so mm. we'll be seeing X-Men them. Was, X-Men was DC, right? No, X-Men's always been Marvel, but uh, Marvel oh. Studios didn't own them. Fox owned them. I can't keep up with all that. Yeah, so Fox owned Fan- Fantastic Four and X-Men. Sony owns Spider-Man, and Disney owns everything else. Wow. Give it time. Now, Disney will own everything. They will. Wow. Okay. All right. That's it for me. I know. I literally know the least about this question than anything we have ever been asked before. I was really excited that I, I'm the one that picks the question. So I was like, oh, I guess we'll have to do this one. Props. Very thoughtful answer, Drew. I agree. Knowing that literally nothing, I agree with everything you said. Well, guess what, Brian? I have zero to contribute to this next question, in fact. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, well, I'll let you set it up then. All right. Well, our friend Emily asks you specifically, Brian, mm. what is it like working with your significant other? Well, I'm glad you're asking me this and not Rachel, because you'll probably <laughs> get a more positive answer. Uh, uh, being honest, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It is probably the single most enjoyable part of Goulet Patents is the fact that I get to work with Rachel. Uh, we definitely have our moments. A close, a close second would be me, right? Uh, close second. It depends how you define close. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>, and second? <laughs> definitely not first. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um, all right. No, 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 I'm kidding. I'm kidding. You're great. Um, but no, Rachel's way better. But um <laughs> I can say that, right? Like, yes, you can. It's just funny. <laughs> working with my wife is way better than you, Drew. Um, oh my gosh. Uh, so we definitely have our moments. You know, we've been working together full time in this for close to 13 years now. And then, you know, we started making pens and selling them like three years before that. So it's going on the better part of a decade and a half that we've been working together the line is, I guess it's really more than full time because it's, let's be real, we don't just work full time. We're working all the time. So probably 20 years worth of full time work that we've done in that time frame. Um, but, you know, we don't really struggle with it that much. Like we're just one of those couples that you kind of get sick of because we spend all our time together and we still are just happy about that. <laughs> um, we are very complimentary. So um, we're very aligned in our goals, but we both have different skill sets. I'm a little more extroverted. I like doing the video stuff and, you know, I'm more of the, I like the, to work in the white space. You know, I come up with ideas and of course all my ideas are great and grand and then they fall apart in the details. But Rachel's a details person and uh, she hates white space, but she absolutely loves solving problems and connecting dots and shooting down all of my ideas that really deserve to be shot down. Um, but uh, it really works well, the two of us as a pair. Uh, in that respect. So um, very aligned. We get to spend a lot of time together, but we have, you know, different skill sets to where we're not stepping on each other's toes too much. Um, And we've really worked hard to develop some very intentional kind of boundaries for each other um, in the workspace so that um, we know who basically has authority to make certain decisions. And we always take each other's you know, perspective into account and things like that, but we're never like power struggling over certain things. Um, You know, maybe early on, not intentionally, we struggled with that more just because we hadn't like clearly defined every aspect of our role. But I mean, honestly, naturally, we pretty well fell into it. Like she is more organized than I am. So she really latched on to, you know, organizing purchase orders and receiving shipments and stuff like that. I would like packing things. I was creating videos. I was doing all type of stuff. So like even when we started the business in the early days, we both sort of naturally gravitated to kind of fill in each other's gaps. And we only have a few things that kind of fall in the middle where we really just both hate doing it. So (laughs) now we've hired for people that can do that kind of stuff. Um, But just, you know, functionally uh, for us, it really just, it kind of works. But um, 
yeah, I will say that like having been together for so long now, um, especially working together for so I mean we've worked in this business together in our relationship longer than we haven't. So the vast majority of our relationship has been built around working together full time, which is just kind of an interesting dynamic that I don't think most that is kind of crazy. Have. I've yeah, never thought about that. Isn't that crazy? Like we've already we've been together longer than we haven't in general as a whole relationship. So just in terms of like our own you know, growth together as a couple and all that kind of stuff. Like it's just, it's kind of crazy um, that that's happened. Like but, you've existed as a partnership longer than you've existed as a yeah. solo human being. Yeah, which is, you know, pretty cool. But um, And then of that, you've existed that, as business yeah. partners longer than you've existed as, as just a, partners. As a, just a regular couple, yeah. Yeah, crazy. Um, so it's pretty wild. So it definitely is, it shapes a lot of, you know, who we are and what we do, but um, there's definitely been, I'll say there's definitely been certain points where that's been more strained than others. Um, mainly when just things in our personal life get really hard. Um, the, the kind of Achilles heel that we end up dealing with sometimes, um, because we're both, you know, we're both the sole owners of the business. So whenever there's something that comes up, you know, if it's a challenge that we're going through, um, particularly some kind of a crisis situation, like using the COVID shutdown in 2020 and all the COVID related stuff ever since, you know, it's not like, yeah, I guess most I'm theorizing here because I, I really have no perspective on what it's like to not work, work, work with your spouse in a professional setting, but you have your job and then you go home and you, you talk about your job, but the other person's not as deeply affected by it. Right. So like they don't know all the same people. It's not like you had a meeting where you had to make a decision and they, know exactly what was said or what was done and they're impacted directly by all the details of it you know if you're working in separate places so you kind of like filter through what you tell them about what you got going on and they can encourage you and you know hear and listen and that kind of thing well the challenge Rachel and I have is like if we have something challenging going on at work and we finish the work day and then I'm I've got something I need to talk to her about she's so like inextricably tied to whatever the given issue or she's also either a factor or part of it or is very close to it or whatever it can make it to be where you know we can feel overly responsible for each other's challenges and, and things like that so we do have to intentionally kind of you now we just have to over communicate in that respect just so that we don't either have work related things that bleed over into our home life or home related things that bleed over into our work life and i'm looking at you drew because i know we do this on a not irregular basis, Rachel and I, you know, like any married couple, you have things that come up from time to time. There you may not 100% have worked through something and maybe that bleeds over into a, a dinner party conversation or a visiting with other family members. And, you know, sometimes because we work together, we can be in a meeting and then we bring up and it. You're kind of like, ah, ha, ha. And then you kind of reach out your point where you're like, oh, there's like something more to this that like they really need to work out. But here it is coming up in a meeting, you know. The, the, the interesting <laughs> thing about that, though, is like, yeah, I have you've seen that a few times, but mm. it's you, you guys are such great communicators mm. that more often than not, whenever that does happen, the reason for it has already been mentioned. Yeah, because true, you're true. very transparent. Both of you practice vulnerability like freaking champs. Yeah, and, we do. We try to. Uh, so anytime anybody's you know shown some uh, chinks in their armor, uh, it's been well covered up until that point. And we're like, okay, well, we know that uh, this is going on. So yeah, you know, it just needs some space right now. So it's been it's been a really special opportunity to see you two work yeah. together and grow. And I think, you know, since Drew, you've been there since, you know, you've been seeing us grow as a couple in this business longer than anybody else. Um, you know, I think you can, you have a unique perspective on just how much we've been able to grow in that way. I will say just when we were younger, I mean, we also started it right when we had kids. So complete exhaustion, struggling through, I mean, we literally brought our kids with us to work for the first five years. So not only working as a couple, but literally working as an entire family in the building with all the warehouse and the everything, I mean, there was no work-life balance. It was no, 100% and and integrated life. <laughs> those years, I know you guys were having a rough time because every day you so were stressful. questioning your entire life's direction because at the beginning, 
you didn't you wanted to have the kids with you and yeah there were there was so long where you were so desperately saying like this is the way it should be we should have the kids with us and I, the whole point of doing this was so that we could stay home and then we had to move into an office and then Rachel was struggling to have the kids in the room with her while she's also working yeah. and and you felt like you were failing at something if you somehow put the kids in, day, in daycare or something. And oh, yeah. But then once that happened, once you actually said, you know what, no, this is a business, it's bigger than us. We are. Mm -hmm. We have these people that we watch out for. We've got this awesome community we're a part of let's just let's go in once that happened yeah. it you you guys had such an easier time kind of honing in on your path and your your direction it's true yeah it took a it took a little while to figure out we were we were 25 when we started all this when we had our kids and did this business and we're, we're 38 now so i definitely a lot of just maturing in general has gone on i think like any couple that's in a relationship for a long time it's it is in itself its own job like it's work you have to work at it you have to constantly improve and reflect and communicate and it just takes time you got to work on it um so i think you know us personally uh, have we've found tremendous advantage in working together and you know being together just in life because we carry over I th what i like to think is the best of both parts into the other um, and so for us, a lot of it transfers over, but that's just our style. Not everybody likes that. Some people like more separation between their work and home life, you know, and we have such a, I don't know, casual style about how we do everything at, at the office, you know, and in videos and stuff like that, you know, it doesn't feel as much like I'm having to work. Obviously it's work, but it's different because I'm just like bringing myself to it. Um, it would be very different if it was, you know, a different type of a job. So it's, it's not the kind of thing that I would say would be right for everybody in all situations at, at all. Um, but I think for us, you know, we, we tried it out in the beginning. We really liked it and we just made decisions to lean more into that. Um, but I would say like the hardest times that has been for us have been with like major life crises when, you know, we miscarried our third child back in 2016 and then had a series of health issues with Rachel, you know, kind of unfolding after that. That was really, really tough. Throughout that whole year, we seriously doubted Rachel's time and involvement in the business. We considered, you know, is this too stressful for us to do this together? And we were thinking about that. Um, we saw through that and that was that was all good. But we've had other times too, like COVID has really caused us to reflect a lot on a lot of things too. Um, especially because then you get like all the health aspects and safety aspects that is inextricably tied with family too. Um, but I would, I would say actually the COVID stuff has helped to, I don't know, like we were so hard driving. Like it's so difficult, I will say as a couple, especially when we, have, you know, we, uh, I don't want to get all into our life story with the whole business and everything, but we started it with very, very little money, very assurance that it would actually work. So it was a big leap of faith uh, that it would actually work and that we could actually draw a paycheck from it. We did not have much of a safety net. Um, it was pretty much just, we believed in it. We believed in ourselves and the work that we uh, were able to do. And you kind of didn't have a choice either. You're like, we have to make this work. <laughs> well, I mean, we, we, kn we knew, I mean, I guess, yeah, we, when I say we didn't have a safety net, like Rachel had marketable skills, I didn't really so much. So she was more of the safety net, but just with this business, there was no safety net. It was either going to work or we were going to have to change careers basically. Sink if, or it, swim. if it didn't end up working, yeah. Um, especially with the young kids and all that. It's not like we could have just gone and started some other random business. We pretty much knew this was gonna have to be it. Um, so we just worked our tails off and purely just you know, good fortune it happened to work out and just a ton of work. I mean, a ton of work was a given no matter what, but it, we worked a ton before this business happened and the pen making thing, it never went anywhere. So, and so we got to here. Um, but I will say now, like it was difficult probably for the first almost 10 years to turn off that like mm, sink or swim, do or die, you know, kind of grow or die mentality. Cause like we were just so used to, if we don't work as absolutely as hard as possible, this could all go away. And to a degree that's always a little bit in the back of our minds cause we're self-employed and that's kind of how it is. Um, you don't ever really get away from that. But I think now we have such a solid team, we have a solid reputation and especially with COVID it's kind of being forced to separate ourselves from work, 
you know, to a degree more. And then just for our own mental health, you know, we both see therapists and counselors. We do it together as a couple. We do it separately. Um, and just having a healthy outlet for activities that we each have that are outside of work, that are even outside of each other. You know, I talk about all my shenanigans that I do outside in the woods and welding and all that. She doesn't have anything to do with any of that. She tolerates it, but she, that is not an activity we do together, you know, and she plays Animal Crossing like it's going out of style, so. You know, I'll also say that <laughs> since COVID began, I've noticed both of you um, <laughs> uh, imposing mental health breaks upon the other quite successfully. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that when we were all in the office, we would say that more, but I've seen Rachel yeah. say, Brian, you need to take a break. And I've said, and I've seen you say, Rachel, you need to take a break. And the great yeah. thing is both of you, when that is said, mm -hmm. the other person is like, okay, yeah, you're right. Yeah. There's not, there's, there's no fighting that goes. It's like, if the other person says it, oh, yeah. you really do trust her. And it's more, you're like, yeah. okay, if Rachel's saying this to me, it's probably true. Let me go chop something down. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like, <laughs> it's more like an accountability partner, right? So yeah. like we, you know, the conversations that we have together as a couple in like outside of work is like, you know, we we talk it through and like, hey, you know, like especially when COVID first hit. I mean, I, I think about this my, for myself a lot because I didn't, our first house before we started the business, I fixed everything on that house. I love tools, I love fixing stuff. I was not, you know, I was not working as much as I am now before we had kids, all that kind of stuff. I was like more in like house flipping type mood. Um, I kind of way over it. And then once we started this business, had the kids, I didn't fix a dang thing around the house for like 10 years. So I gave up basically all that whole side of life. And then really right before COVID hit, that's when I decided to get a little bit back more into woodworking. Once the kids were like old enough where they could sort of have their own activities and we didn't have to be like constantly watching yeah, them. Go like do something. With toddlers. We started to feel a little bit more freedom back just as individual humans. So, you know, we, we kind of started doing that. And then once COVID hit and I was home a lot more, the stress of that, it was like, I, I literally, you know, like four o'clock would roll around and I'd be like, I literally can't work functionally anymore right now. You know, and I'm, I'm a little more fluid with my time anyway. I'll kind of like run out of energy around four or so. And then I'll like go work outside a little bit till dinner and then I'll get a second wind. And so I'm like working in like weird pockets of time, kind of just some, it's more about like energy management than time management for me, my personal style. But that works for me. I like I like having that flexibility. So um, I will say that like Rachel and I both through you know therapy and counseling and then just talking together as a couple, both in work and kind of home, we've talked a lot recently, especially about managing stress and all that and what that takes to do that more as like an ongoing thing. Because let's be real, we can't just run this business like it's year one until we retire. It's just not practical um, for our own sanity. So COVID really forced us to reflect on that and just say, you know what, if we don't grow a couple more percentages this year, but we have a little bit better, just kind of a mental state and we're able to do some activities that take some of the stress off and I can move my body more and stuff like that. Like that feels like a worthwhile trade off. And that's, that's actually been a really, really healthy thing for us, despite the stress of COVID um, that we are really trying to carry through now, even as we're finding whatever this post COVID world looks like for us. Um, you know, I'm still working outside. I'm still just enjoying that. Um, you know, even just for an hour or two a day, you know, I'll be, I was like working on random stuff. We'll talk about it more later in, the, in this episode, but you know, I was doing stuff last night and I just, I don't know, I enjoy doing that. And now I'm getting to do it with my kids too, which I really love too. But um, yeah, so I mean, in general, I would say if you have a situation, if you have, if you have a partner who you feel like you really would like to work together, your skills are complementary, and you have the opportunity to do it, definitely try it. Like, don't be afraid of it, but just be aware that you're gonna have to like way over communicate. And I will say it comes with a great sacrifice of a social structure. Like we really don't have many friendships outside of like parents of our kids, friends kind of a thing. And like, I mean, I have other friends, but they're busy. We're busy. We only get together very, very seldom when the stars align and we can all kind of hang out kind of a thing, but we really don't go to dinner parties and all that kind of stuff. So like that fits our style, you know, but to work together and be together, it consumes pretty much everything, especially if you have kids, a family, all that kind of thing. So that's the trade-off. I don't watch movies. I don't watch sports. Pretty much all my time is fixing stuff, my own little weird hobbies I talk about in the pencast, and then, you know, working and just doing our family thing. That's, that's basically my whole life. So I like it, but maybe it's not for everybody. So 
There you go. It would kill me. I could talk about but it. I, but I pre- but I appreciate you doing it. <laughs> exactly. Awesome. Exactly. You Drew, you to give you credit, Drew, you have such a great like boundary for yourself. Like you're all in at work. Obviously you have like stuff that comes up and you have to whatever, go to the vet and get your something fixed on your car and like you work in that life stuff, but you're never like carrying stuff like from one place to another heavily. Like you're really good at like no bouncing out those two so yeah no i've never never done that i I, i've never i think one day in 11 years i don't remember what that day was i (laughs) I was stressed when i got home because of something that happened i remember you it was like a few months ago actually that i I don't remember the exact situation what it was but yeah yeah it's very rare rare. that's i know it normally takes something really pointless and stupid to frazzle me yeah that no one else cares about There you go. All right. Cool. All right. Well, that's all we got for the Q&A. We are going to mix it up a little bit this week, aren't we, Drew? Yes, we are. <laughs> all right. So um, we're going to... Oh, you go ahead. Uh, instead of uh, doing a tip of the week, we are going to be doing a hypothetical. hey oh, We're going back to old PenCast here. That's right. Because just before this PenCast is being recorded, I got a message from my pen friend, Brianna, in the mythical land of California who sent me a really, really interesting hypothetical. Mm. And it's been a while since we've done this, Brian. It used okay. to be a staple in the early PenCast episodes, but I it thought was. this one was worth worth, pa- worth passing along. All right. Um, and I, 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 fir- I first thought I had an answer, but now I'm not so sure. So we're gonna have to, we're gonna mm. have to ping pong back this we'll, one, so. We'll, we'll rumble with this one a little bit. I do not know what this is. Drew is just bringing right. this to me fresh. Let me make sure I read it uh, okay. exactly All right. correct I'll get, here. I'll get, my, me... I'll get my clarifying questions ready. All right, so it is, uh, would you rather cut to the front of any line anywhere for the rest of your life or mm. have front row parking everywhere you go for the rest of your life? Hmm. So clarifying question. By cutting to the front of the line, is that just me or is it whoever I'm with? Do we all get to cut to the front of the line? I would say whoever you're with because that would apply okay. for a car as well. Yeah, you know, yeah. Every, okay. So I, I don't, I don't think that that gives you an unfair advantage to the opposite end of the equation there. Okay. So, yeah. That, that yeah. Kinda, let, kinda let's say, let's say you and okay. you and you know. Because I'm thinking if, I, if I'm are, at like a, if I'm at a theme park or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like think, I, I can cut the line, but I'm leaving everybody else. That doesn't save me anything. Right. Wait right. For no, let, let's let's yeah. include you know your you know immediate party. Okay. Oh man. Yeah. Theme theme parks definitely popped into my head. I mean, theme park is the place where I probably wait in line the longest. That's where the lines are, yeah. And honestly, I, I recently have uh, experienced hmm. since since COVID, there have been a lot of like drive-through Christmas light events yeah, as I well like, I feel like that I've might. had to sit in the car for so long. Mm. Um, well, wait a minute. If you're doing a drive-through thing, what, did, what does that count as? Are you cutting the line uh, <laughs> in the car? <laughs> well, no, because you don't park with those. I would consider that to be a line. It's just a driving line. Okay. Interesting. But, yeah, lot lines are definitely a thing. I will say in general, I I don't really go for the closest parking spot everywhere. I don't mm-hmm. mind walking. You know, I kind of like the exercise. So You also never drive downtown. That's true. I never so drive downtown. So would you would you go downtown more if parking were less of a concern? Is parking a part of the equation for you or is that just like, "Eh, no, I just got nothing <sighs> down there." I don't intentionally avoid downtown necessarily, but I okay. I just don't have as many things to that I'm going there to do. Yeah. Again, Rachel and I have no social life, so we're not like <laughs> you know, going to a restaurant in the big city. You know, we're no, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're gonna go to like the local pizza joint. That's like you're you know, some farmer or something. I mean. Was I not I'm knocking around? You're the not. You're not that. You're not that rural, bro. No, I'm really not. It's not like it's an hour to go into town no, to find a not. grocery store or something. No, not at all. Um, yeah, I don't know. COVID's really messing this question up for me because before that, I probably would have said waiting in line, but now between like having smartphones and then like being able to like whatever, I don't know. Even if when I get a haircut, like the place I get my haircut, I've got an app and it shows me the wait times and I put my name in, so I'm only having to wait like five minutes. You mm-hmm. know, and it's just like not as big of a deal. So I would say the cutting lines, just because, why not? The parking, also, Dis- the Disney doesn't have uh, Disney doesn't have fast passes anymore. So, well, now Disney—that's a whole different scenario. <clears throat> it's a whole different scenario. 
but yeah i mean it's and that's where that's where you'd get your money's worth if you're if, you, if you're choosing the cut and line one like you're getting your money's worth at theme parks true because you're parking like once and then you're in the theme park all day if so you're even parking thing. a lot of people fly and then do buses depending true. on where you're at true like we're true. we're we're like 12 hours from orlando yeah but if you if this applies to like whatever vehicle you're in your bus you could be like a first one to get up there on the bus whatever like your bus could be the just go drop you off right at the front or whatever i don't know i'm sort of applying sure okay but i mean the, the, the lines are where it's at like a, if you're going to do like rise of the resistance or something uh like that without having to deal with those weird queue times fair fair i mean come on that that that's a big win however i wouldn't pick that you would pick the car I'm, one? I'm picking the car one. Yep, absolutely. Really? I I have, and I have talked to my pen friend Brianna, you, you uh, Bri- do, Brianna about you this. You do one. hate bad parking. I things. hate it. I, that I, makes sense. I once drove to Washington, D.C., which is, mm. you know, about two hours from here, depending on the traffic, um, two, two, like one and a half to nine hours, depending on traffic. Um, <laughs> That's quite a <laughs> But I, dr- I drove to D.C. to see my brother's band perform, and I could not find a parking spot. I was getting so mad. I turned right and left, drove right back to Richmond without parking. Get I was out just of here. like, dude, I was like, F it. I am not, I am so done. I'm done raging. And I just left. I was wow. not having it. I hate finding parking spots. I hate, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. And for me, it does level. keep me from downtown. I love going to restaurants downtown. We were just mm. there uh, yesterday and it, it, it stops me from visiting because I'm like, I, I, it's not worth it for me. I hate the stress. I hate wondering, okay, does that sign apply to now? It says between eight and five, Monday through Monday. Wait, no, huh? Does that oh, mean yeah. just Monday? You're all week, ah! you know? Yeah, it's I'm just, you uh, you're, it's like an equation you have to do. And of course, people that live in the city are like, oh no, it's easy. All right, well, I've never lived in the city, so it's confusing to me, sorry. Um, that's just the way it is. That's the way it always will be. Mm-hmm. So yes, absolutely. For me, parking, for sure. I would love to just never worry about finding a darn parking spot. For me, I park the first spot I can find regardless because I just don't want to have to deal with it. I don't care if I have to walk. I just mm. don't want to have to deal with finding a parking spot. That is an, a thing I don't want in my life. It's like cutting the grass. I don't want it in my life. It's a waste of time. Hmm. It's just, it is a waste of life in my opinion. Now, standing in line, you could say is also a waste of life, but at least the lines at Disney are interesting and sometimes entertaining. So I'll deal with that. And besides, standing in line for Disney happens you know, a couple times in your life Whereas parking constantly. I mean, there's like other lines, like at the grocery store or whatever. You're like waiting in line for like other people to bag up your groceries and blah, 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 you know. I mean, you can still pick that stuff up. You can still order it and, you know, do the click list. I don't know. I mean, there the- are ways to avoid that. Theoretically, but it's not the same, like picking out your own produce and stuff. I hate going to the groceries. I hate the grocery but- store. Too. <sighs> this bothers me about myself. <laughs> I don't like going to the grocery store, but I don't. I, I've I've very rarely actually like ordered and then like picked up the food. You would think I like you would think I like doing as that. I am, you would think my wife I, doesn't. I should she, or, she doesn't approve I should of how the they order pick the and produce. I should just go and pick it up. Yeah, like, it's super easy. I love it. I don't know why I don't do it more. I really should. You would think, but it's just one of those things that I have trouble letting go of. If that makes sense, mm. it's one of those weird quirky things about myself. The I'm more things for, I can get other people to do for me, the better. That's a win. I'm like that with <laughs> I'm like that with some things, but other things like with you, Drew, like mowing the grass, I could have someone else mow my grass. I should have someone else mow my grass. Well, you've got a lot of grass, bro. That's yeah, like I got a lot of grass. That's a different expense time. than what I'm dealing with. <laughs> and like it even came up where like I needed to replace my lawnmower. It's not an insignificant investment for when you have I've got you know, I've got like a couple acres of grass, right? So it's not an insignificant amount of time. And I can't just like buy some cheap push mower. Like it needs to be like, oh, otherwise yeah. it would take me like seven hours. Yeah. So I need to invest in like an actual piece of equipment. So I, I, I came up on this like a year, year and a half ago where it was like, okay, I could either get like a whole new lawnmower and the whole thing, or I could hire a service and I got it quoted out and all that kind of stuff. It was really expensive, but yeah. I couldn't do it. I just could not do it in my mind. I was like, I can't manage it. I can't even, it like, was like a foreign concept to me. It shouldn't, you know, I'm, I delegate and I do so many other things with the business, but with like certain things around the house, I just can't, can't let it go. I don't know what I don't it know, is. Man. I would rather, I would rather clip my nails or literally anything that's just a 
stupid activity than cut grass. But anyway, we're getting far off from the topic. Yeah, what was the topic? Again? So, so you're choosing the hypothetical of the I'll lines. I choose the lines, right? I guess. Yeah. But All right. I'm, I'm there not you go. Super passionately on one side or the other. Okay. Well, this 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 started off as uh, Brianna's writing prompt. So, if you would like to use it as a writing prompt, go for it. Let us okay. know which one you would pick. There you go. So, there you have it. Nice. Fun hypothetical today. Good stuff. All right. Next up, Brian, we have a spend, we have a pen spotlight. We do. Pen spotlight. This is on the Twisby 580 Iris. We're not going to drone on and on about this pen because it's a model that probably many of us are already familiar with. And it's basically just a different trim. It's a different finish on an already very popular model. Um, but we just wanted to talk about it because it's very timely. And uh, yeah, just felt like low-hanging fruit for us. So um, I have not, not seen Not like this. we want to give you low-hanging fruit. I mean, like low hanging fruit's good. Low hanging fruit tastes just as good as high hanging fruit. <laughs> Maybe even better. Uh, <laughs> anyway, just take your fruit and don't complain. There we um, go. So anyway, so here's your fruit. So beautiful pen. Truth be told, I have not seen this one in person myself. So I'm gonna rely well, on Brian, a little more it's on lovely. you, Drew. Yes, I'm very excited about it. This is one. So like. Rachel is a big Twisby fan. She has many Ecos, several 580s, no 580 ALRs. She does not like the grip on the 580 ALR. I do. I like it all. There's no wrong way to Twisby uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so normally we'll have like, oh, okay, I'll get this one. You take that one, you know, just so we don't have like duplicates of everything. Um, but this one, we're each going to keep one of these because we, <laughs> we both like it. And we might, we might both end up with a broad as well. Cause this, really cool. this is absolutely lovely. I have the VAC 700 Iris. Yeah. I've got that one. I like it a lot. The, yeah. What I was curious about was the clip because the VAC 700 has got that like matte finish to the clip. Yeah. Yeah. So I was curious if they were going to do that. I didn't know if it was because of the rainbow they did that or whatever, but no. Well, no, the VAC's was... always had that sort of clip. Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't know if like, I don't know, I guess I was more surprised when that had it because I didn't know you could do that finish on a matte clip like that. Yeah, I was surprised. So yeah, I guess I shouldn't have expected this one to have a matte clip because it's not actually related to the the iris finish. But I guess I was just curious. So, but it's not, it's not a, not a matte clip. It's a shiny clip. No, and you know, I really didn't want to like this. I, I wanted, the, <laughs> I wanted to like the vac more, but Really? You like this one I'm, more, you think? Okay. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that the VAC 700 has a larger nib, which means a larger True. surface area of this beautiful two-tone design. True. However, I, I, it really is the clip. The clip makes it so much better mm. just aesthetically than the VAC. The, I don't know why the clip is like that on the VAC. It just breaks it up. Mm. I, I, I'm very... I appreciate unity when it comes to mm. balance and aesthetics. I don't want one thing being different than the other. If you're going to have a, a thing, have it, you know, reciprocated somewhere else you don't, you, so that everything you don't, is balanced. <laughs> you don't support power clashing? Oh, no, not if it's just one thing. Like, I, I'm it's all like for an, an obnoxious. It's like an accent. I'm, I'm all for an obnoxious pen, but. Uh, it's got to be uniformly obnoxious? Yeah, otherwise it looks like an accident. Mm. And. That if, if, we, if the VAC 700 put that same textured metal on the trim ring by the knob, I would be perfectly happy. Because it would balance it out? That would be fine. Yep, that would be fine. All right. This, though, it's it's uniform. It's clean. And, man, this this finish is just astonishing. It's so beautiful. All right. Well, Ugh, let the record show it. Drew is anti-VAC 700 Iris. Uh, Will you... Brian has the last week. Anytime I say anything <laughs> negative, he's like, oh, Drew is anti this. God. Yes. I'm trying to cancel Drew. Is what's happening. <laughs> I'm being canceled. Only, only around really unimportant things. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, man. No, I'm with you. I think, it, you know, it's different strokes, right? I think the, the, the VAC 700 R is what it is. I don't think that it's, it's necessarily. It's beautiful. I think it's a it's a different enough pen from the the 580 where it's kind of like when the ALR had the Prussian blue and then came out with the navy. They're both so good looking. It's tough to call, you know make a call between the two of them. Yeah, and in fact, there are going to be plenty of people that buy both mm. ALRs and both of the irises as well and be perfectly happy. I'm sure. I'm sure it's a good looking pen. I like it. 
so yeah, I I approve. Uh, what I you know the only thing about this is you know the vac the the 580 normally has a replaceable nib unit that you can do. They do not have replaceable iris nib units. Right, right. So just be thoughtful about which nib size you want to get because you're going to be with it for a while. So that's the only yep. thing with these. Normally you'd have a little more of an option, but I guess you technically have an option to put an iris nib on a different 580 if you would sure. be so inclined. That's always a thought. One um, little bit of good news is that we have had the VAC 700R iris for quite some time, and we have not had any customers come back with any issue about the finish. Yeah, it's so very, it very is, durable. Yeah, It is very durable. So if you were curious as to how that would hold up, maybe waiting, wait no longer. It, it, it's fine. It's yeah. durable. And trust me, if it were an issue, we would have heard about it by now for yeah. sure. So Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, All ma'am. Right. All right. Well, if y'all got any questions about it, let us know. But as of today when we're publishing this, we should have them available. If we happen to be out of any of them, just sign up on the email notification and uh, you'll be notified as soon as we get it back. All right, that's all we got for the Iris. Drew, let's move on to what's happening. All right, um, I, I have a, I kind of have a lot, but not a lot. So uh, yesterday, <laughs> okay. like, like this weekend, I don't think a whole lot happened this weekend unless I'm totally forgetting something. But it's possible. Uh, yesterday, I took a day off from work and my wife and I just spent the day together doing, you know, random stuff. We didn't have a plan, but it ended up being a really good use of the day off and we really um, mm. optimized it. So uh, took the kid to daycare and then I came back and we went to, uh, we went downtown to a place I really wanted to eat called Capital Waffle uh, Shop. And all they sell are waffles, dude, just waffles. Sounds like you're gonna place. They like we're talking big Belgian waffles with all sorts of random crap on there. They had savory waffles, sweet waffles. They had like, it, it was, it was like Michael Scott's pretzel of waffles. Like <laughs> it was insane. And it was so good. Little tiny place, like maybe only six tables. So definitely a good place for a weekday visit, a nice, you know, Monday visit. Nice. So that was fantastic. I got a savory one. I got just a uh, chicken, and gravy and eggs on my waffle Whoa. and oh my god wow dude it was killer it was so so amazing it that'd be good because so... like the all the little pockets in the waffle would catch all the gravy oh and... yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. it was a great way to start the day now, now need... when you eat your waffles do you just like cut into it willy-nilly or do you feel like you got to go with like the grid because i um, i usually like I'm talking like a Eggo classic, like Eggo waffle. That is a good question. I would good always, question. I would like eat it like down the line. I couldn't so just like when, bite into it like an animal. 100%. That is a valid question. And you know, I am particular about the way I eat a lot you of things. Are. So yes. Uh, you care a lot I'm about at, unimportant things. So when I'm, in, <laughs> <laughs> when I'm at Waffle House, I do that. So it, that's okay. just syrup and butter. Uh, when okay. I'm at Waffle House, I will eat one quarter at a time. I will cut that quarter off and then you know, bisect that quarter and eat, eat that and then move on to another quarter that I do cut along the lines. Okay. However, Waffle House does have a Waffle House logo in the center, so the lines do end prematurely. Okay. You have okay. to kind of find your way after that. Mm. But these were really thick and they just had a ton of crap on them, so you couldn't even see where the lines were. Okay. So yeah. I didn't worry about it. Also, the one complaint I do have was there was only plastic silverware here, Brian. So oh, man. I had like a, I had like a Stanley in the warehouse trying to eat steak moment you know yeah yeah <laughs> the, the the knife was all bendy and floppy but anyway i got it done I, i'm not letting plastic crappy plastic silverware stop me from putting all that in my face it sounds like knowing this now next time you should just bring your own silverware and then you can be you can be that guy yep or just <laughs> might dump it down into my gullet there you go so just after that i was feeling a bit full needless to say <laughs> so like we were we were about uh, four was this like a breakfast thing or was this a lunch oh yeah that was breakfast that oh was breakfast God. boy that's a, oh that's yeah a, that's a lot for breakfast oh it was hefty that's like go out work on the farm kind of a yes breakfast. so mm -hmm. I I felt the need to walk we were about four blocks away from the river and the canal so we walked a uh, little south to well, I think it's south yeah um to the uh, Kanawha Canal which runs you know at that point parallel to the James River. 
So we walked along there for a couple blocks and made it to Browns Island, which is where they have the Pride Fest and the River Rock Festival. It's mm -hmm. like a you know venue around here. So we went and you know looked at the river and stuff and kind of just got rid of a few <laughs> calories <Digested>. at least. <laughs> yeah, and then walked back up because Richmond is at the James River Fall Line. It is kind of a slant down to the river. So walking back up was a little. Like, okay, we're hot and tired now. <laughs> yeah. But Shannon found a 7-Eleven, and it was 7-Eleven, so she got a free Slurpee. So that was kind of a nice. very magical moment for her. So after that, we actually um, went back to the house, let the dog out, or the puppy out, because he's still a wee man and needs, needs to be let out, mm -hmm. and then took a check to our wedding venue, Brian, that we got married at, at 2008, because we had um, friends who were going to get like officially married, but then COVID happened. They ended up still getting married, but they didn't have the celebration. So they basically gifted us their photographer and is a nice photographer. Hmm. So we get a wedding picture redo just through the good nature of our friends. And that's cool. At the place where you got married. And and if you'll remember, you were there. Our wedding photographer was like a newspaper photographer. He was not he was what we could afford. And hmm. we don't have any of our wedding pictures hanging in our house because everybody was squinting cause and blown out because it was just not it was a very a good day. For it was a very bright, sunny day outside. Yeah, yeah. So we don't have any good wedding pictures. So this is really exciting. So we dropped. We were getting. We're getting the new pictures taken at the wedding venue that we got married at. So that that's really exciting and pleasant. So we're going to get that done in September. So we dropped the deposit off with them. So nice. that's all done. And then we went to Home Depot, did some appliance shopping because I am totally fed up with my washer and dryer situation. Mm. I've fixed the heating element for the dryer a weird uh, chip issue, a sensor, probably one other thing. And that thing's still making weird noises. And then mm. the washer, though, that thing can't even go through a full cycle without producing an error code. Um, oh, gosh. It's the, uh, it's the drum. It's not, it's not leveling properly. I took out all of the uh, bars that level it. I bought some additional washers, like zip-tied the heck out of them to tighten them up. Yeah. It, it, you know, I've followed so many tutorials trying to reinforce the thing. It works for a little while, but then it starts wobbling again. So we're just mm -hmm. done with it. So it's it's been over 10 years. So we're going to go ahead and move on from there. So, yeah, did that. And mm -hmm. then we felt we felt like we deserved a sushi snack. So we took a break and went to get some sushi after that. So that was also pleasant. Wow. And then finally, she needed to get some character shoes, which are like dance shoes for mm -hmm. theater. Um, they're just mm -hmm. like boring tan shoes that you can wear. They've got like kind of suede bottoms so that they don't slip, but they can also slide, I guess, a little bit. But anyway. Yeah, it gives you like just the right texture when you're like dancing yeah, on yeah. stage. So she needed, she needed yeah. some more of those. So she went to this mm -hmm. dance supply place and there was a hardware store right next door. So I went in there because I needed some spackle. And, Conveniently uh, located, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm like, all right, let me just do that. So I went in there and I also got a uh, GFCI outlet because guess what? Mm hmm. So the lights that I was having an issue with that we discussed a yes. couple episodes ago were on the front of my house, obviously. Okay. I went everywhere in the house looking for this darn outlet and everything, they all, they all have actually lights on them. You know, all, yeah, I tested yeah. all of them. I'm like, which one is it? Went and looked at my breaker box again. Everything's fine. And then the next day I was letting the dogs out and I saw, uh, I missed it because it's in this plastic outdoor weather, you know, proof thing. Yep. And I didn't, I don't see it ever. But then through the clear frosted thing, I saw a little red light. I'm like, oh, that's you. the culprit. That's the culprit. On the opposite end of the house. Yep. This is on the back of the home as opposed to the front of the home. And then mm -hmm. that was it. And the uh, reset button is not working. So I need to replace the outlet. So, ah, uh, okay. yep. So it's totally done. But I, I, we found it. And presumably you were right. So thank you very much. Oh, I am right. Go. There's no question about it. I am right. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that awesome. probably that probably is it. So um, mm -hmm. I just need to kind of uh, you know replace that. So got the outlet, did that, and nice. then went home and made some meat pies. I, I found a kind of quick and easy meat pie recipe where instead of making your own uh, dough, you use like a pre-made 
Pillsbury crescent roll dough and just remove all of the perforations from it and then yes. fold that into little meat pockets. And yes, dang, if that wasn't like really good. Yeah. Shannon, whip, Shannon whipped up some gravy and yeah, man, we had ourselves some pub food that night. That's awesome. Man, y'all, yeah. y'all ate really well. <laughs> Sounds I, awesome. Yeah, it was a pretty awesome day overall. Mm. And then we also had some, we also had uh, like some, before we went to get Archer, we just sat on the love sack and she took a nap and I played video games for like an hour. Nice. And it was, it was our first like video game nap sack situation and it worked just fine. It was the nap sack. That's like the perfect name for that I thing. I mean, it really is. So it was a pretty perfect day, man. Pretty That's perfect. awesome. And the weather was great too. It was. Yeah. It was it's fantastic. Like, it's like 15, 20 degrees hotter today. Like if you had taken today off instead, you would have been miserable. Yeah. You wouldn't have eaten a giant waffle and then go walk down by the river. You'd have really <laughs> passed out and, <laughs> and fallen into the river. It's been so hot. <laughs> yeah. It really worked out great. It really worked out great. Nice. That's awesome, man. Yeah. It was fantastic. Man, I'm really hungry now. Jeez. Um, Dude, those, those waffles were so good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you got some of that stuff done. I got a bunch of random stuff to talk about myself too yeah um got my sinkhole fully repaired all good right. to go even had joseph help me uh patch it a little bit you know not that, well, i did all the concrete and stuff but i had to do the asphalt part of it um so yeah that was super easy it seems really intimidating but basically if you need to patch asphalt you buy blacktop asphalt patch it comes in a bag and it's like i don't know it's kind of an interesting texture it's, it's i don't know how to explain it but it's like if you like melted chocolate and then threw a bunch of rocks in it, it kind of feels like that. So it's like this- like, kine- like kinetic sand? It's kind of like a kinetic sand if it was like made of tar and rocks, because that's what it is. So you just dump it out of the bag and you pack it down with a tamper and make it relatively smooth. And then I let it cure for a couple of days. And then I put some like, um, now the stuff you buy it like in a jar, it's like to patch like smaller like cracks and stuff. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So I put that over top of that to smooth it out. And now, I mean, it's like black and everything else is kind of gray around it. So it stands out because it looks new and fresh, but right. Like, you know, did, did, leveling, did Ellie make a sign? Lines. No, no, I've got, I've got some like orange cones Aww. that I've got. That Cause she had, the, she had made a sign, right? Yeah, she did. When she, the hole was there. <laughs> she did. She put she, she, she used some sidewalk chalk signs for me. Nice. Um, so that was cool. Got that all taken care of. That feels good. Um, I'm not going to say I was inspired by your power washing story, but it was just coincidental that I also needed to power wash my own house. So uh, watch out that. for those lights. Did that. Yep. I was thinking about you the whole time. <laughs> Haven't had any, uh, haven't had any breakers pop on me though. So thank goodness. Um, but, uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, I have a, I have a professional background in power washing. Um, that's what I was doing when I started making pens. And that was part of the, part of the pre-origin story of Goulet pens was. Yeah. I think I you touched on houses. it last time when we were talking about my situation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I've power washed hundreds of houses. Um, and I did like deck sealing and stuff like that through college. So I've quite a bit of experience. So it's kind of like riding a bike. Um, but my dad, he, he had a power washing business for, you know, he, he started it right before I graduated college. We worked in it together when I graduated and then he kept doing it after I started Goulet Pen. So he, he power washed houses for 17 years, I think. Yeah. So long time started when he was like 49 or 50. So yeah, that was like his second career basically. Um, he's a tough old dude, but, uh, yeah. So, um, he, you know, cause we were crazy busy with the business and he had a power washing thing. He washed our house for a little while there, but now he's retired. So I don't know, I got, got a power washer and I wash it myself now. And it's just one of those things I'm like, yeah, I just kind of enjoy doing it. But what was different about it this time is um, Joseph has some like Lego sets that he was uh, interested in getting and we're not anywhere near birthday or Christmas time or anything like that. So for literally years, I've been working on my kids of like, well, you guys can earn money. We have jobs, we have chores, da, 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 and lists and all that. and. A, billion mentions of different opportunities to have them help things and they're like eh. oh um, yeah that's me that's joseph, me right now that's where yeah. i'm at right now so i'm I, this is a message of hope so joseph is 12 and a half now and he does not he's not an outdoor kid he's you know he loves coding he loves video games he loves all that kind of stuff yeah that's mine too but by golly the kid surprises me sometimes he approached me out of the blue and was like hey uh he's like i really want this lego set and i need to earn 25 dollars more to get it and 
I asked mom for things to do. Uh, and she said that there might be outside work. He's like, I know outside work can pay well sometimes because I, you know, it's hard work and it's dirty. Yeah. It's, yeah. You know, you can't just like do half of it and then leave it there. You got to like finish it out. So I was like, yeah, actually. So I was like, <clears throat> I wasn't like, like really planning on washing the house right at that moment, but it was like, well, I like, I need to power wash the house. Cause I was trying to think of like, okay, what can I do? I don't want to like fell trees and like put him in danger or anything. So it's like, okay, what, yeah. could, what could I have him do that? I like think he might enjoy and be able to see through it's still work but it's not you know absolutely grueling where it'll be like he'll be complaining and stuff the whole time so i was like okay power washing i was like i could probably probably swing that and i could you know i ended up doing most of it of course but i can have him rinse and i can have him help stuff run and get me things you know um but you know honestly he had such a great attitude about it he stuck it out there with me for like over two hours Wow. Working out there. And it was nice. Like we, we did it after dinner time. So we like kind of did it until the sun came down. So it like wasn't blaring hot sun, you know, it cleaned, cleaned up nicely, but he was out there. He stuck with me. He was, and it just like was one of those things where like I for years have dreamed of like all these shenanigans that I do outside. I'm like, man, I hope one day my kids express enough interest. Like I could like force them and drag them out there, but that's, I mean, every now and then I might do that, but let's be real for one, that wouldn't be very fun for them. And for two, it would be very fun for me because then I would just be no. like hearing them complain and all this kind of stuff the whole time. So like the fact that he was motivated to be out there with me and then I was like trying to make it fun and interesting and teach him some stuff too. Um, and it was just a really, really cool kind of a bonding thing that he and I got to do that, you know, kind of he prompted, which is really just gratifying in my soul. So that's that was awesome. Cool. Yeah. That's really like, fantastic. And the fact that like I used to power wash like with my dad. So it's, it's weird. It's not, it's weirdly like one of these things that like probably most people don't share like a bonding experience over washing a house, but you just never for, know. for those, us those specifically, sorts of things, yeah, it's like, it's almost yeah, like they a, manifest in a lot of different ways. Sometimes yeah. it surprises us where we don't even expect a memory to be tied to our parents until we experience it with somebody else. And then it's like, boom. I mean, I remember my dad being there with me when we were like, we had a, a sewage like leak in our yard and we had to go dig it out. And it was like October it was 40 degrees. Well, I hope you don't have to share me. that with Joseph. I hope not. But you know, if that happens to him on his first house, you bet I'm going to be over there with a shovel, helping him dig out his sewage. Like, so like I have memories like that with my dad. Like I remember being, I think I was 10 and I was learning how to sweat copper pipe, like on a water pipe or something underneath the house. <clears throat> and like, I did not want to be in the crawl space. And I was like, I think that my dad really did drag me along, but he was like, this is a skill that you're going to need. And I want to teach it to you. And I was like, I remember reluctantly going along with it, but by golly, when we had our first house, I needed to replace our hot water heater. We had no money, you know, so I was barely able to buy the hot water heater. and. I'll be darned if I didn't sweat that copper pipe remembering, learning that at that young age. And I was like, dag on it, dad, you were right. So I think about that kind of stuff. And I like, I'm not gonna say like, I am on my kids about that kind of stuff, but you know, I definitely provide plenty of opportunity for them to join along and that kind of stuff. So that was cool for him to actually. Like, I think that's the right way to go about it. You want to allow the opportunity, but like you mm -hmm. said earlier, if you force it, it yeah. that that doesn't work. Like, you know, that doesn't work with kids. So exactly. Exactly. You have to kind of like place it in front of them and see if they grab it. Yeah. And then to continue on, um, you know, Joseph has, I don't know, he's been kind of in a in mood to, I guess, like organize his room a little better. He's. His what whole, his whole room is Legos. Like that's okay. everything he's got in there is Legos and clothes. He has like one dresser with clothes. Literally everything else is Lego. So um, yeah, he like you know basically has had you know like dressers and stuff and just like Lego things that he's built just like piled on top. You know, but he was like he actually like took some apart. He's breaking things out by color. I'm like, where is this coming from? You know, but at some point, you know, you get older and you want to, you get motivated and you figure out how to do that stuff. He's got the patience. So I have to, to wait another through. four years until Archer does that? Maybe. I mean, <laughs> Ellie's 10 right now and I, she's not on the same trajectory. I don't, know, just, <laughs> I don't know if she'll ever get, I don't know if she'll ever get there for that. Anyway, different kid. But um, yeah, but then uh, he wanted to like do some shelves. He was like, I've got some Lego creations that I would like to mm -hmm. display. I was like, okay, cool. And so... You know, Rachel was like, oh, we can get some shelves. And I was like, no, let's build some shelves. I was like, it's something that Joseph and I can do together. You know, I love doing woodworking. It was like another thing that's like, yeah, Joseph, let's like learn it. So I, I like gave him the tape measure. I had him take some measurements and all this kind of stuff. We designed a shelf. So um, 
we've finished the shelf. I haven't hung it yet, but basically we're doing a, um, a natural edge like wood shelf that is going to be a floating shelf. And I like, you know, worked with him on it. I was having him sand it and we picked out the wood and all this kind of stuff. And it was just like a cool, like, okay, like, wow, I'm able to sneak in some little stuff here and there. That's you know? awesome. Yeah. And I'm also realizing like, I'm trying not to be overly excited because he's getting into it. I'm like, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, whew, I got to like tone it back. I can't do a deep dive, like pen cast answer on like every step of the process. Cause I'm just going to like overwhelm the kid. Scare I gotta, him away. I got to like gauge his reaction, you know, and like let, let him do the more interesting parts of it. And, um, uh, that kind of stuff. And like, you know, whenever we're working outside or whatever, I always keep like lollipops and stuff like little dum dum tootsie pop kind of things. Cause the kids like, they're just, you know, to keep them engaged. I found if they have lollipops, they're more inclined to want to go out there and I'm not above bribery, but. Uh, oh no, you do that with every order that goes out of the Goulet paint company. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Yeah. So that's been really, really cool. It's been an interesting, interesting thing. Like this, this summer feels a little different with the kids. They're, I can tell how much, how they're maturing and uh, it's still, they're still kids and it's still it's not as many socks everywhere, I will say, but they're <gasps> also not putting on many socks these days because <laughs> they have no, they have no responsibilities. They have no work. To be. Right. They're not putting, they're not even putting on socks. Oh yeah. It's no. Ar- like wearing Archer, pajamas like, all day, you know? No. Ar- when the summer comes, Archer's pretty much exclusively Crocs. Like, there you go. That. Yep. Not a bad way to go. Um, and then I don't know what it was. I guess we were really productive last week, Rachel and I, you know, we've had, I don't know if you have the situation, Drew, but we've been together a long time. We've moved many, many times. We've had various kid clothes and decorations for different seasons of the house, but we've like collected all these different types of bins, like large, like tote bin type things, like those 20 gallon, you know, tubs, but they're all different brands and different lid shapes and none of oh, them yeah. fit into each other and all this kind of stuff. And it was really frustrating. We, we, we literally still had Christmas decorations in our bedroom next to like the door that goes to our little side attic because we just <clears throat> didn't have the right bins and just, the stuff couldn't fit in there. And we wanted like clear bins so that we could see what the heck is in there. And they had some bins on sale. So we went and bought some like coordinated clear bins and took that stuff and like organized it. It ended up being this whole thing where we went through like our guest closet and all these things and just like organized the stuff that has just never really had intentional organization. And uh, that was most of our weekend was like dealing with, we have like all these old pillows and stuff that we've just collected over the years from like when the kids would get sick a whole bunch of times, it was like, well, let me buy a bunch of cheap pillows so that we can like yep. deal with that. Now I'm like, all right, I've got like five of these like $3 pillows. Like, what do I do with these things? Okay, I'm gonna like bin them up or I'm gonna donate or I'm gonna do whatever, you know? So just like going through stuff like that, it was a lot of work, but we definitely did it. And then we went through like our medicine cabinet and we looked cause we had all this medicine that was like stuff that we bought like pre COVID and all that. And we looked at the expiration dates and it was like, oh, there's a lot of this that needs to be replaced now. And we, we replaced probably like 90% of our medicine because we have like cold medicine from four years ago and just stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, that's how time. it goes with the medicine cabinet because you don't rep- you do not do it often. So when you do, it's like, you, let me throw away yeah, most Yeah, it was like the whole, the whole project was like pulling a thread on a sweater and you're like, oh, yeah. wait a minute. What's the expiration date? Oh, what about this? Oh my gosh. Okay, what what's this back here? What, oh my gosh. Where, what is it? A nebulizer. Do our kids even need a nebulizer anymore? Like, right. Joseph had croup as a toddler. And oh, I'm a like, glass vial of field morphine. Right. How'd that get there? <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> so we're like pulling the stuff out. And I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. So we went through and did a lot of that stuff. But it was really, really good. Went through a whole lot of that. Um, and so, yeah, it's 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 not where we want it to be yet, but we made a good dent. Oh, you made progress. That counts. That we counts. did. But it's like, that was like most of our weekend. So it's like, oh, like it feels good to have gotten some of that done. I like organized some of the junk in the garage and all that. And it's like, it feels better, but like I really didn't relax at all on the weekends. Um, and so, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. It's like one of these days, one of these days I'll relax. Friday afternoon, buddy. Friday afternoon. Yeah, we'll see. I already have something scheduled. Come on, man. Mental health day. I know. We have a mental health half day scheduled on Friday. Practice what you preach, bro. What did I have? I had something that I had to put in there. I can't remember what it was. Don't be a hypocrite. <laughs> no, it's all good. Um, yeah, so that was cool. And then last thing, um, finally closed the chapter on the spare tire. Spare tire. Thing. <laughs> yep. So I ended up, you know, I ended up 
making my own spare tire mount for the trailer. Truth be told, had I realized these things already exist and I could, I just didn't, I didn't, didn't know the right place to look for it, but I found one at Tractor Supply Company that was basically exactly what I ended up building. Ah. That probably cost like $20 more than it did for me to just make my own. But in theory, it was easy for me to make my own, but then like I needed the right bolts and I needed the right, the other like accessory things to actually mount the tire to the thing that I made that I ended up spending half of what I would have spent anyway. And I was like, okay, well, in retrospect, I should have just bought it. But I really just wanted to practice the welding anyway. So I ended up making my own metal welded tire mount onto the trailer. And it turned out pretty much exactly like I envisioned it. Now I have a very solid spare tire mount on my trailer with two new tires plus a spare. I am not concerned about a blowout on that trailer anymore for the time being. <laughs> That's one of those things you put so much effort into, you're almost disappointed when it never happens again. Cause it's well, like- Well, that's just it, yeah. <laughs> this whole trailer, it's like Rachel does not care about it at all. She cares nothing about this trailer. I've done so much work on this trailer. I probably could have just bought a new trailer at this point cause I've replaced <laughs> almost everything on this trailer at this point. I've like sanded and refinished the whole thing. I replaced all the deck boards. I rewelded the deck. I've replaced all the tires and all this. I'm like, man. If only I'd known, but whatever, it's fine. It's still good. It's super still trailer now. It's it's all new and it's all stealth out too. I painted it like matte black. Stealth so out trailer. I've got this like Batman, you know, <laughs> trailer. I don't know, because I had to paint it anyway. And I was like, and if I try and make it glossy, like I'm never going to get like a smooth looking finish on this thing. I was like, if I just go matte, then it's like, whatever. Everybody's going to be disappointed you didn't make it blue, Brian. <sighs> I mean, yeah, I guess blue black trailer. Just, black just hides everything so it was easy but, oh yeah um, so yeah finish that so getting some good good welding practice in there enjoying that i now own like five angle grinders that's become my latest collection because it's really annoying when you're in the middle of trying to grind something metal 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 working it's really dirty it's gratifying when it's done but it's not as to me it's not as enjoyable as a process as woodworking it's gratifying like when it's done because it feels very permanent Mm -hmm. so i do like that aspect of it but every thing about working it is more dangerous it's dirtier it's more hazardous it's harder it's just not as to me it's not as gratifying probably because i'm not like set up for it so i'm having to like grind stuff like in my yard because i don't have like a garage to work on this stuff yeah so i'm like having to kind of it just sounds overall more violent whereas whereas woodworking is more Working is more romantic. There's more, more fin- like finesse. Yeah, it's more personal. Yeah, well, you feel like you're, you feel like with metalworking, you're like fighting it. You're like submitting it to your will. Woodworking, you feel like you're more in harmony with it. I think. Yeah, and while metal does exist in the earth, what you're working with doesn't isn't a very like outwardly natural material. Whereas wood is like you feel like you're connecting with something from the earth yeah. in a way. So yeah. it's it's a totally different vibe. I, even without, yeah. I understand kind of where you're coming from, even without having done either of these yeah, things. Yeah, it is pretty It is pretty interesting. So it's, it's interesting having a woodworking background and then working with metal. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I would never make a spare tire mount for a trailer out of wood. So, like, it definitely has its place. But sure. uh, I don't know. I'm really enjoying the process. But, yeah, I definitely find, like, you know, when I need to change the paper, like the sanding stuff and the, you know, the the grinding discs and all that kind of stuff. It's like, you need to go through several of those with each step of the process. So I find like having several anchor grinders, like with each of those set up on it already, it goes much faster than like having to change out the head on it every so. So now I have a bunch of angle grinders and I'm just like, this just never ends, does it? I'm gonna do this the rest <laughs> of my life. I'm gonna end up with 30 sheds <laughs> with every new hobby and obsession that I get into. And I'm just, I'm going to burden Rachel with all this because uh, let's be real. I'm probably going to go before she will because I don't sleep and I work all the time. <laughs> I'm going to go and I'm just going to leave her with, with 30 well, sheds filled with. You could make, make it a really hobby. swanky container house in the field. Oh yeah. I'll end up building my own probably like post and beam, like farmhouse for all this stuff <laughs> or uh, whatever. I don't know. I laugh at myself, but yet I still keep doing it. So. What are you gonna do? I enjoy it. <laughs> All right, that's enough for me for my turkey hammock zone. Um, got a couple of company updates, and then we'll wrap this thing up for y'all. All right. Well, we do have a video that we were planning to launch this week. Probably not going to get to until next week, so it's a little bit of a preview. Yeah. But if you enjoyed 
either of Drew's two previous videos, the pens under 25 or pens under 45, you're now gonna have a video of top $60 pens. So a little bit, a little bit uh, next level there. So look forward to that one coming out probably next week. Um, also did a favorite team pens video last week. Seems to be going over really well. Thank you everybody on the team for that. It's not everybody on our team, just a few people, but uh, always nice to get some different perspectives besides from our just flapping our jaws on this pen cast. We also have a <laughs> corresponding shopping guide. If you go to mm -hmm. our website and uh, look under shopping guides, there's a staff picks section now that includes all of the uh, uh, pens that we mentioned in that video. But also we kind of got together Rachel and everybody and said like, what else do we think is really cool that we'd like to kind of include as our personal favorite? So you'll see accessories in there, uh, things that aren't necessarily in, on the video that we wanted to put on that page. So you can check that out as well. Perfect. Um, we also sliced out, um, I don't remember what what Pencast episode it was, but it was one where we showed you all um, how we pull and pack orders. So that was a uh, pretty popular when we did it in the Pencast. So we made it its own video. So if you're curious to kind of revisit that or um, wanted to see that outside of the context of a lengthy pen cast. We now have that as, as its own thing. So you can check that out. And then, uh, you know, just a, not a video related thing, but we are going to be closed as we're launching this on Friday, the whatever day it is. Um, we're doing a mental health half day. So we're shutting down the office and everybody's taking a half day. And Drew, I think you're going to be watching Thor, if I'm yes. not mistaken. Yes. Awesome. That is how I'm going to relax. Awesome. I go to the, I go to the, dine-in movie theater. I've done this with Batman, Dune, Doctor Strange, and now Thor. I'll take my mental health half day. I'll go to Cinebistro, <laughs> have a bread pudding and a coffee. And I pick the third from the front, Brian, because in the front row that's on the floor, the seat to the far left isn't connected to another seat. It's just all on its own. So I do that Ooh, seat so I can nice. be totally by myself. Wow. Not like anybody else is in the theater anyway, like 2 p.m. on a Friday. Right. But still, I like it. It's my thing. It's it's zen for me, and awesome. I, I value it greatly. There you go. That's awesome, man. Love and thunder. Love and thunder. I literally didn't even know that that was a thing. Like, I didn't, I hear about these things now, like, after they're already, like, box office hits. I don't keep up with movies. That's actually pretty impressive. I feel like at this point it takes kind of effort to avoid Marvel stuff. It's so everywhere now. I just don't see or watch anything. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Unless it's displayed in my woods or on a shed or a trailer, <laughs> I'm probably not going to see it. I'm surprised my kids don't ask me about it. My kids watch things, I guess. I my know. kids watch things, I guess. I don't really know. <laughs> I mostly ignore them. I'm just kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. My goodness. No, you know plenty of what they do. You know what they're into. No, Rachel makes fun of me for how much I will not tolerate commercials and advertisements anymore. Like, of literally of all the things in my life that I could spend my time doing, watching an advertisement for something is the bottom thing on my list. So like, I don't care whatever streaming service or whatever thing, like I will pay whatever premium needs to, to not watch those ads. Dude, that's exactly, you're describing exactly how I feel about cutting the grass or looking for a parking spot. Like I have no tolerance for things okay. now, now, Fair enough. no, yeah, we different definitions. It, but, but in terms I, of the feeling of like you're just sort right, of like you, you by were it. just yeah. you were just robbing me of yeah. precious lifetime, you know, yeah. and I and I will not permit that. Like that, that's exactly how I feel with other elements in my life. There's got to be some elements you just choose to just. I'm not going to let this take my time. Yeah, there and there, then there's a price. There is a price to be paid for that. Yeah, yeah. So like, I would rather like mow my own lawn and not pay somebody for that so that I don't have to watch ads on a stream thing. <laughs> right, like, there you whatever. go. Yeah, you know? it's all different, but yeah. same. To each their own, right? Yep. Anyway, that's all we got. So let's go ahead and wrap this thing up. I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us questions. Give us hypothetical ideas. Whatever you want to do. You know how this thing works at this point. Definitely check out gulepens.com for fountain pen, ink, paper needs, all that good stuff. You can subscribe to our YouTube, Instagram channel, whatever, leave us comments, leave us likes, shares, all that kind of stuff. Any engagement you have only helps more people to find our stuff. Um, if you want to email us, if you're an audio listener especially, you can email us at pencast at goulaypens.com. And I have a random fun fact for you, Drew. I also have a random Truly. fun fact, but I'll let you go first. Oh, well, you go first. We'll end on mine. All right, I want, I want to do another turkey hammock test. 
Ooh. just to see if it, like at this okay. point we've already Brian has already said leave a comment subscribe like so a lot of people have clicked off at this point okay you know the metrics you see the drop off that happens at the end of the videos absolutely absolutely so I want to share with you a definition that you can take into your life and this is this is a precious thing passed down many generations of my family oh boy meaning probably two if you're wearing a sock and you've got a dangly part <laughs> off your like, toes like the sock has slid down your ankle Right, and you've got, and you've got, got extra some floppage. Sock at the, at the yeah, toe. you've got extra sock. That floppy part is called a winky. <laughs> All right, so you can take that, and that if you a, that is a brown fa you, brown family exclusive there. <laughs> absolutely, and if you take if you put uh, sh uh, put winky in the uh, comments if you've listened this far. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but it doesn't have a name, Brian. Like we've all experienced that. Yeah, of course. Why it, it, we should have some like oh gosh I got a winky you know it it's a, if we need to sometimes we need to refer to this phenomenon this sock phenomenon so uh, <laughs> now I have empowered you there you go to actually are you are you give gifting this, that gifting that to the community for them to share now. in their yes, own absolutely. lives absolutely absolutely there you enjoy go. take it how generous. distribute it how generous of you it's a uh, free fair use there you go yeah there you go I'm curious if anybody else just whether that's a thing somewhere and your family just like adopted it from some obscure place no and somebody el somebody else also knows it or if it truly is like you just made it up and now this is going to be like what it's going to be no what, what's now. more likely to happen is somebody from you know i i don't know uh, denmark is going to be like oh that's really offensive over here actually that's you can't say winky <laughs> over here <laughs> that's a that's a racial slur Drew. you just <laughs> offended our nation right seriously i'm sorry I'm not aware of that being the case with that particular. Oh term, no, we never but, am. Never, you know, never are. But, you know, but so. uh, it is interesting. I'm curious if anybody else, here, or if anybody else has a name for that thing, Winky. Um, there you go. That's your gift. But uh, all right, my, you go ahead. What, what's yours, Brian? So my random fact has nothing to do with that at all. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so Lucille Randon from France is the current oldest living person on Earth, at over 118 years old, and and some months. That's what I mean by a hundred, over 118. <clears throat> so my fact, at the time that she was born, which was in 1904, by the way, there was a completely, at the time that she was born, there was a completely different set of humans on the planet. Think about that. So she and every other oldest living person at any given time is literally the only human to have ever lived with both of these sets of humans at the same time. So at the moment she was born, there was a whole different set of humans. And then at the moment right now, a whole different set of humans. She's the only person to have lived with both. Isn't that crazy to think about? That is absolutely bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> also, I can't believe we didn't bring this up, Drew. Did you see the James Webb telescope image? I it was did. just announced. I love that. I showed it, I showed it to Archer. How did we not bring like, that hey. up earlier? I was That's like, so hey, cool. Archer, what do you think these are? He's like, stars? Like, no. Galaxies. These are galaxies. He was like, <gasps> I discovered, I discovered that it was like 11 o'clock at night and Rachel was like playing Animal Crossing or something. And I'm like watching, you know, the president's like announcement of it or whatever. And I'm like, what? These are like 13 billion years ago, whatever. And I was like, hey, Rachel, yeah. you got to see this thing. And Rachel was like, kind of like, oh, that's interesting. And then it reached that point with her where she was like, nope, too much. Can't deal with it. Yeah. Oh, I'm, yeah, absolutely. I'm, shut well, it the, off. Uh, <laughs> the, um, the deep field image from the Hubble isn't vastly unlike this one. Right, right. Um, this one's just like it, it, greater clarity, but we've taken some trippy pictures before. Like that oh, yeah. Have, yeah, like the, the deep field image, I think, has more galaxies in it. But I don't yeah, know. The but, one I but saw, that one took like years to produce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, like yeah, an the one HDR I saw type image. This one was just like, either. click. <laughs> yeah, it was their first one. So yeah. it's only going to get more insane. Yeah, they're like, yeah, we're going to discover all kinds of ridiculousness. We don't even know what we're going to discover yet. And then I watched like another video about like how they had to polish the mirror in order to get it. So that mirror, this is so random. That mirror, they had to, in order to get the level of clarity that they need, they literally can't even have it at like whatever room temperature or space temperature. They have to cool the mirror down to what negative 380 degrees Fahrenheit because that's the, for whatever stability purposes or whatever it is, that's the level of clarity that they need because apparently the heat, like all things have heat, have a natural heat from them, just from the sun and stuff bouncing off of it. So the heat just from any telescope, just from it existing where sunlight is, will impact the clarity of the image. So they have to cool it down to that level to get 
the level of clarity that we're talking about here. But they were talking about they need the level of polishing that they need in order to get the clarity on the James Webb telescope, how flat those mirrors have to be <clears throat> at that negative 380 degrees. They said it was equivalent to, I forget the exact term it is, but it was like the equivalent of if you had a mirror that stretched across the entire Atlantic Ocean, you could only have the tolerance that was no more than uh, three quarters of an inch across the entire Atlantic Ocean. That's how flat this mirror has to be. But they said that you can't just polish it at room temperature and then cool the mirror because just the natural cooling process will cause imperfections to cause the mirror to warp. So what they had to do was cool the mirror down, find all the imperfections, measure exactly where those imperfections were. And then at room temperature, they had to imperfectly polish the mirror at that measured level of imperfection so that when oh, they, so when when they, it, so that when when they it cooled back it, up. when they cooled it back down, it would correct itself back to be that equivalent flatness of three quarters of an inch wow, across the entire Atlantic Ocean. That's just kind of like a, uh, realigning a gold nib. Isn't that unbelievably <laughs> complicated? Like, I'm just like, how oh, yeah. in the that'll, world? That'll, like, I, I just can't even, your brain. I can't even conceive. And I'm just like, this is blowing my mind. So I was like <laughs> trying to show all this stuff to Rachel and she was like, nope, can't, nope, don't want this information in my head. This is too much. And I'm just like, look, ah, oh, mirrors, ah, polishing. And she was like, nope, not interested. <laughs> Anyway, fun fact. That sounds familiar. Very cool little thing. Here we go. Nice little bright spot in our world which seems to be filled with terrible things. That is something cool and interesting that we can all kind of get behind. Anyway, that's all we got for you this week. Thank you so much. We'll catch you all on the next one. Thanks for watching and 